When you have realistic expectations about a situation, 99% that situation works out just fine. It's when you have unrealistic expectations. You know, so for me, it was like I had the real expectation of, I'm gonna come here and it is going to be saturated. There, it's going to be impossible to get a gig for three months. I need to have enough money to survive for three months without working. Or I have to take another job to be able to do this. And you know, once you set those real expectations, sometimes that's not how it is in a good way. I cannot change the way the world is Only to me can I be true No matter how much I affirm this Won't be the same without you All right, welcome everybody to Nashville Drummers Podcast, episode 20. My favorite number. Wow, I can't what? believe, does it feel like 20? Is that like a milestone, you think? I think it is. I really should have brought that bourbon. Yeah, we were talking about that earlier. Yeah. I want to say quickly, thanks again for all of our listeners so far and all the support in the community. If you're new here, please give us a follow on Instagram at Nashville Drummers Podcast and check out our website, nationaldrummerspodcast.com. Sign up for our email newsletter and definitely leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. That really helps the podcast grow and helps us reach new listeners. So we appreciate your support. Our next guest is a Nashville-based multi-instrumentalist and educator. Having performed, recorded, and written as a drummer, vocalist, pianist, and guitarist. Damn, that's very talented. That's a lot of stuff. It's a lot of things. We're mostly just talking to drummers on here. Mm-hmm. But this guy is, yeah, we're going to get into He's all really that. raising the bar. He is known mostly for his work as a drummer and percussionist for artists including Ben Schuller, Endless Earth, Too Hot for Leather, Ryan Clark, Palmer Anthony, and Ali Keck. Received his Bachelor of Music Education at Central Michigan University and his Master of Percussion Performance at Michigan State University. And upon moving to Nashville here in 2021, he immediately began working as a regular on Lower Broadway, where many of you may know him with his regular act, Too Hot for Leather. And with that, please help us welcome Kevin Keith to the podcast. (laughs) What's up, Kevin? How you doing, guys? Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for joining us. Absolutely. Anytime. Yeah, man. So you moved in 2021. Where are you from? I'm from Michigan originally. Michigan, that's right. Um, so center of the state, small town. Lived there through my college years uh, until I got my master's degree at Michigan State. And then I moved to Denver for five years. So I lived out in the mountains for five years and then moved here in 2021. So yeah, just three different places. Didn't move around a ton as a kid. I was in one place for a long, long time. Very, very yeah. kind of nice, quiet, small town in Michigan and yeah, so that's where I've been. How was moving in pandemic year 2021, was, right? You know, it was it was kind of right as things started to reopen. Um, I remember the day before I left Denver was the first day I ate at a restaurant with full capacity oh. since like March. And it was the like the first day they started really reopening things up. And uh, it was right as I was leaving town. That and, feel kind of, I don't know, cathartic to leave on a positive note. That's a, yeah, that's a great way to look at it. Yeah. And, um, I actually went back a couple of times over that summer to play a couple gigs that I still had left over from a band that I was working with out there, a party, uh, wedding cover band. So it was, it was kind of cool to go back and do things again, you know, so I still had the chance to go back, but yeah, it was kind of, it was a little weird in that way as a cathartic is a good word. I would even, I would, I would venture weird almost mm. more than anything else. It's almost like, uh, it's just, it felt like a, this very close the door kind of moment. Yeah. You know, like it was a great time. It's time to go, but it's good to see that, you know, this place will still be here. Right. You know? Yeah. It's mm-hmm. one one thing to leave when things are like, well, don't know what's going to happen now. Right. Yeah. Like, sh- hope you guys hold on for dear life. And like, no, yeah. things are, things are kind of going back to normal. Yeah. Great. Yeah. I don't feel like there's no sense of guilt. No, it know? wasn't. Yeah, definitely. It, I don't remember feeling guilty yeah. at all. It was, it was definitely a feeling of okay, you've, you've done what you needed to do. It's time to, it's time to go and experience this new thing. Mm-hmm. You know, That's I'm awesome. Sure, yeah. And I'm sure we'll, yeah, all the, all the details of which I'm sure we'll cover at some point, you yeah. Know? yeah. but it's, uh, yeah, it was, that's, that's, I hadn't really thought about it that way until you brought that up. So mm. that's, that's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, man. I, my well, mind is already opening. Thanks to Nathan's life. Yeah, hey, <laughs> that's awesome. I'm, that's, I am the that opener of, of minds. The opener of minds. Oh, yes. <laughs> all right. Everyone breathe with me. Wim Hof. Breathe yeah. in, <laughs> breathe out. Feel. We need yeah. to do a breathing session. We do. With you know Drew. what? You, me, Drew, and then uh, yeah, I heard that's, it. We'll yeah. live stream it. It'll that's, be great. Oh my! And I'll just do a shameless Wim Hof impression. Vim. 
Wim yeah. Hof impression yeah. the entire time. I'll just I'll just do the whole thing like by script. <laughs> and we got to get someone to play the the guitar and that whatever that little that little synth sound that plays at the end. Yeah, you know yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like every time it gets to that, I'm like, oh, it's okay to be alive. Existence <laughs> is good. Yeah, yes. start crying. Yeah, yeah, it'll be sponsored by Aquafina and Forks. It'll be great. Yeah, there you go. So that's who the new sponsor is. Water. <laughs> water. Nice. Yeah, not forks, but uh, <laughs> brought to you. You know what? We do drink a lot of water. We yeah. do. <laughs> okay, let's start. Okay, let's start with the beginning of your musical journey. What yeah. does that look like for you? My parents put me in piano lessons when I was four, and their story is they had an upright piano at their house that was um, awesome. My my mom's mom's is from her from her house when she was a kid. It was an old spinet piano. And um, she said that they, they always tell the story that I was starting to pick things up by ear mm-hmm. on the piano, like playing. I, I, we used to go to church all the time when I was young and I was playing these you know, hymn tunes from church. I was playing on piano, but, but from ear, yeah. getting them wrong, of course, in many ways, but getting them <laughs> close enough where they'd recognize them. And the, the one person at the church was a piano teacher, this um, short Welsh woman would just, you know, would just drive you into the ground if you could. I mean, just <laughs> very driven, yeah. very motivated, you know, motivated her students super well. Um, and she just passed away, actually. God rest her soul. And um, mm. what was she, her name? Uh, Meyer Allsgard was her name. Yeah. And she, uh, she was wonderful. And she talked to my parents at the at church one day and said, if he's starting to play by ear, you need to get him in lessons right now. Yeah, so that's a good sign. <laughs> so he can learn. But not even so much like, you know, he's, you know, he's going to be great. It's like, no, I mean, I don't think anyone really knows. But um, yeah, it's funny. Just to yeah. say quickly, as you're telling the story, I'm mm-hmm. hearing her, despite the fact that I have no idea what she sounds like. <laughs> I know the accent so yeah. well because my right. first teacher was also Welsh. No so way. So I'm, I'm, I'm hearing that going. Is that why you asked me what her name was, just in case? Uh, yeah, <laughs> just, like, I just wanted yeah, to hear. Yes, yes. Yeah. I want. I just want. Well, I just yeah. wanted to hear it in mm-hmm. that voice, like yeah. how I imagined. Anyway, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. And Meyer, Meyer Allsgard, she married the, the into the Allsgard family. Allsgard, obviously, not being a Welsh name at all. But mm-hmm. um, but she uh, but she said that mainly because she didn't want me to get to a point where I couldn't read music. And I only worked by ear, hmm. you know, as you said, we don't, you don't want him to get to that point. You know, if, if he's going to be playing music in school and public school, they all read music and you want right. to be able to do that. And so there's another uh, musician working at the church pianist, Bill Bankstall, and he was my first music teacher. I mean, he was great with kids. Like he was one of those people, just super flamboyant. They're very outgoing. Yeah. He teaches people how to love the instrument. Yeah. You know, Charisma, more, man. Very yeah. much so, you know, and he, and he was very, you know, he got to a certain point. He's like, okay, he's progressing to a certain level. Go to Meyer now. Go to That's Meyer so important, you know, in an early, an early yes. age. I had the same experience mm-hmm. with percussion lessons. Like it, yeah. those early teachers, like, they were actually very talented. It was actually like through the orchestra back yeah. home. But, but yeah, it was the same idea. Like they, they taught me how to really love the instrument. And then at a certain point, it was like, okay, you've, you've advanced beyond what I feel capable to provide you. Right. And now it's like level up to the next guy. I, yeah, know? that's so important, you know, and it's, it's something that, you know, it's something I've tried to maintain just in anything, you know, where if I hit a level of anything and I'm not providing, it's, it's, there's somebody else that will do it better. And, and if it's, especially if it's a student, you know, it's okay, go work with this person, you know, because mm-hmm. I'm still learning, you know, but yeah, and I say, started studying with her when I was in third or fourth grade, I stayed through piano lessons all through high school, but I started taking drum lessons in sixth grade with the start of public school, public school band with middle school band. And um, I would have to say that was probably, if, if I can point to any particular property that my parents have that I'm like super thankful that they have, it's that they made me wait for things hmm. when I was a kid. And I hated it when I was a kid, you know, I was just, it was, it was all, and I look back on that and I'm like, thank the Lord they did, you know, cause they, I wouldn't have been ready. You know, I wouldn't have been ready for drum lessons when I was in elementary school. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I had so much to learn. I had so much discipline to learn. You know, I was a, I just, I feel like I was a really scattered kid at times. Yeah. So when, when you say like, you they know, made you wait, were you kind of jump in to take lessons, drum lessons? And, and oh, they, yeah, I wanted, I mean, I wanted a drum set. I wanted a drum set since I was in like first grade yeah. or second grade. I mean, and they, uh, they had a pair of drumsticks in the car so I could play drums along to records in the car. So they were like um, teasing you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I wouldn't say, te- yeah. I would say teasing me. They were more excited. I mean, like just making sure that I had something to do yeah, while yeah. they were waiting to get to that point, you know, yeah. but there was this little bag that they had that would attach to the headrests of the car mm-hmm. and it would just hang down on the back seat and it had, you know, toys or, you know, supplies and stuff like that. And I would just beat the piss out of it, yeah. you know, with yeah. my drumsticks. <laughs> and I would, uh, to like Beatles, right? I'd listen to Beatles and Queen. They, the first two albums they ever played me were Past Masters Volume 2 by the Beatles. So like the later stuff, yeah. not, not the early Beatles, but the later Beatles. And then Queen Greatest Hits, Volume 1. Wow. And so it was like- from, As a child. <laughs> as a child. Do you, I mean, yeah. They, pretty good selection. Talk about developing your ear right yeah. away. Yeah. 
Yeah, I don't say it enough, and and if, I'm sure my parents are listening to this. But yeah, you're so cool. You guys are the coolest parents. <laughs> they like, love you. They really did, you know. But uh, dude, it is so, yeah. that is I'm not to more, be understated how yeah. incredibly valuable it is to have parents who value music. I'm just gonna say mm-hmm. it straight up. Who val- yeah. value music yeah. as a teaching tool, as just something that adds to your life, whether your kid's gonna be a musician or not. Right. Yeah. It's <laughs> I can't. I don't understand when it's not it's not a part of the thing like. Bring it into your kids' lives because it will just add value. Absolutely. Bottom, I don't care if they're going to play. Yeah, no, and that, that's 100% true. You know, and that was, I had to adapt that. For a long time, of course, I was thinking, you know, when I started off teaching, you know, and getting into that realm and I was young and, you know, silly and stupid, you know, yeah. but it was like teaching for music's sake and and the idea that these kids, I'm going to make these kids be musicians. They're going to be musicians when they grow up. And it's like, that is so not the point. Yeah. You know, like it's totally okay if you got a student who is top of their class and at their high school band and they're scoring top in their class and their solo ensemble events and their IEs and all that stuff, going out and do drum corps or whatever, yep. you know, and they don't go into music for the rest of their life. Yeah. Like, it's a hundred, I think that's, even, that's almost better in yeah. some ways. Cause that you know? kid is still enriched. Like they're still learning so much valuable yeah. yes. you know, content from that, that they're never going to lose. And they're going to take that into their careers, whatever they do, they're going to take that love of hopefully learning into their careers, you know? And it's like, that's, I think what it is. You just have to teach them how to love, how to learn yeah. more than anything else, right. you know? And that's my, thankfully having parents like I did, they, they are learners. You know, they're always looking for stuff. They love to learn stuff. It's, you know, my dad, he called himself, you know, this where, a warehouse of useless information because he'll just know things about things that no one has any business knowing things right. about. Yep. But he just likes to learn stuff. And it's like, that's such a wonderful way to live life. Right. You know, like they do. And so it's like, you know, if I can get even close to them, you know, with that yeah. stuff. So they, uh, that was, you know, short story long, that's where my music career began. Yeah. It was like that long ago, but with that context, I guess. Yeah. So do you remember the first drum lesson? So you went from the sticks in the car to then your parents <laughs> decided, okay, he's yeah. ready. I'm just curious if you have a story or a I, memory of that. I don't know if I remember my first lesson, actually. Yeah. But it was I probably don't. through the public school, right? Uh, it was with a private teacher, actually. The private teacher, okay. Yeah. Um, my, the, the public school system I was in in Midland at the time was was small enough that we didn't have like private instructors at the school. We actually had one... I had imagined there was more, but the one guy in town who had been teaching in that town for 30 years up until that point, since mm. 1977, I'd started in 2000, I guess it would have been 2001, yeah. two ish around there, but he was the guy, you know, Jim Volkerson. He was born and raised in Midland, Michigan, went to Midland high school where I went to high school, gigged for a long time. And then, you know, got married, had a family and started this teaching studio has, he teaches six days a week. I want to say five or six days a week. And he teaches from. 2 p.m. to 10 p.m. every single day, every single slot is filled. Like, yeah. wow. All times a year. You know, it's like there are wait lists at times to get it. I think there's a spot that opens up and stuff. It's like for the small little community. Yeah, he's got the market cornered. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and, and then for good reason, too. Yeah. You know, really for good reason. He runs a percussion ensemble program and he has levels of percussion ensemble. So he has a, like a third and fourth grade ensemble, fifth and sixth grade, seventh and eighth grade, low high school, high high school, and then like a beginner adult group. So if there are people that, always wanted to play percussion, never got to as a kid. And then he has them come in and do percussion ensemble, and like teaches them as they're going through the ensemble mm. and stuff. But that's kind of cool. Yeah. You know, so that's, that was a drum teacher, but it's uh, no, I don't remember. I don't remember my first lesson actually. <laughs> I, I was, I'm trying to rack my brain. I remember there are other definitely like, I would say checkpoints yeah. that yeah. I do remember, but not my first one, Yeah, which is weird. <laughs> I think it would. But do you remember the moment that the the switch kind of flipped and you're like, oh yeah, drums, drums, drums yeah. really drums. Yeah. I think it was when he started handing me Neil Peart charts. Oh, yep. <laughs> uh, and I, as I'm sure a lot of drummers would agree, you know, I think that's the bench point for a lot of, and he had the, he had the photocopies of the old, like mid 2000s books. Someone went through and transcribed a bunch, all the hits and he went, you know, Red Barchetta, Subdivisions, Jacob's Ladder. He was throwing yeah. all this wow. stuff. TG, you know, and that's how I learned about odd time signatures, you know, yeah. and, and playing out of just straight, you know, four on the floor stuff. And mm-hmm. that's, I think that was more when it became not so much just like a, I want to be really good at this to a, man, this is something I want to do the rest of my life. Hmm. You know, and that's that, so yeah. cool. yeah. it was when he, pres- when he started having me just play along and just said, learn how to read these, you know. And it's kind of just out of the blue. Yeah. You know, got lucky in that way. But yeah. 
It sounds like your parents' influence is really impactful for you and like their love of learning was kind of also passed on to you. Yeah. Would you say like you also kind of fell into that compassion for education and learning and then you think that kind of propelled you forward to what you would eventually study in college and you know, and you're actively teaching now. Is that correct? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, I um, I've I've taken a bit of a break from the public school education. Okay. Um, I offer, I still do lessons here and there, private lessons from time to time. Yeah. Um, but for about ten years or so, I was I was working as a percussion instructor in the public schools, whether it was in Michigan or Colorado, and then um, for a year here. And especially when it clicked that teaching the kids music isn't about teaching them music. It's about teaching them life lessons, mm-hmm. you yeah. know, and, all the, all the other things. Right? It, yeah. It's really about, you know, and I think more than anything, you know, and, and where I won't go, I don't get too deep into, you know, the, the societal stuff. Right. But like at a time like this, the, the last thing we need is like to pump out drones and clones. Yeah. Just telling, just kids telling us they're doing what we tell them to do. You know, it's, it's, we need kids thinking for themselves and, and empowered to, see the world around them in a positive way, mm-hmm. in a way that will then influence the rest of the world positively. Mm-hmm. And the, I think personal opinion is the best way to do that is to teach them really how to learn on their own. Right, You know, 100%. to find the information, do research, you know, challenge your opinion at all costs, you know, mm-hmm. always challenge your opinion and then come out the end. Then you're coming out the end, the best possible person, best yeah. possible musician, whatever, you know, profession you end up in or whatever your goal yeah. is. But that was some my parents always instilled was just you know the goal is to be as good a person i think at the end of the day well and simply trying to tyrannize kids into doing the the music thing the the technical best it's just simply won't work no absolutely not because you'll the the, especially with kids you're Mm -hmm. like okay your job if you're doing music education or real probably any kind of education for a child is keeping them interested in it. Yeah. Like I could, I made the mistake when I was first teaching so much that I'd be like, all right, so working on whatever it is. I'm like, ah, that technique's not quite right. So let's like really, let's really focus on that until we get it right. And it becomes this dry technical exercise. And they lose focus on the fact that we're learning a song that you like. Mm-hmm. And then they get bored and they don't want to play drums anymore. I'm like, yeah, yeah at that I can, point you've, I can you've lost fix, yeah. I yeah. can fix a bad habit, but I can't fix you not loving the instrument anymore. Yeah. Like, and I'll, and I'll say this, I've said this to a bunch of my students. I don't just want you to be a good drummer. I want you to have a good life. Absolutely. And I'm like, if, yeah, exactly. if me giving you this stuff is going to like somehow enrich your life. Awesome. Yep. If the path to you becoming a great drummer, which you like talk to me, oh, this is what I want to, I want to be great. And like, if that's going to make you like miserable or hate your life, suicidal, like yeah. what is, what is the point of me teaching you at all? No, I did it, it. You hit it. You hit a point when it becomes, you know, and, it, and I think you put it well with the idea of, you know, tyrannizing kids into learning, right? Yeah. You know, tyrannizing. What I hear the most from people, educators, parents, is their concern that if you tyrannize them, they'll stop caring and they'll stop doing what you ask them to do. Is there, and I found it's a little bit, there's a little bit of an opposite other side of the coin where you tyrannize them into learning. They do everything you want. They right. want you to do. And they do it with zero joy. Right. Yeah. Which is that worse. Is the yeah, worst worse. Thing it's way worse. Ever. They're doing what you ask them to do and you can see the dread in their eyes. Yeah. And that is the worst feeling in the world. And I've seen it too many times, you know, from myself and others, you know, obviously I've made that mistake numerous times. Yeah. And I've learned never to do that again, you know, mm-hmm. or at all, all costs and that, you know, direct away from that. But um, when COVID did hit, I mean, and I was, I was working as the, the percussion the main percussion instructor for the middle and high school that I was teaching at, you know, I, I almost stopped caring. I mean, I had to (laughs) face it myself where it was, what's the point in a way, you know, I think we all kind of had this crisis moment of what does this all mean if the world's ending, you know, what does it really mean? You know? And, um, and I think that was maybe when it really shifted in terms of how do I have to teach and what, because I couldn't teach the kids, mallet instruments because most of them didn't have mallet instruments at home and there's no point in teaching yeah. them if they can't execute it and and work on it on their own and you know i looked at every single one of my students over zoom over the you know, over the camera and you know i remember distinctly my one student she was in eighth grade at the time and she was one of those kids just only wanted to play mallets and i said didn't want to touch a drum and i looked at her and i said here's the deal um you can't play mallets right now yeah. It's not possible. You don't have a mallet <laughs> instrument at home. I know you have a piano. Yeah. We can do a little bit of working on that, like theory, but you can't play mallets, you know, and I'll, I can have you play on a, fa- you know, but I think our time would be better used 
if we made you the best snare drummer you can ever be? And I said, what do you think about that? <laughs> and bless her heart, she looked Man. me in the eye and said- Talk about a tough conversation to have with yeah, a child. Yeah, and I was like, you know? I'm either going to lose this poor student, <laughs> yeah. and I'm like, I'm trying to do everything I can, and like, I know this is not what she wants, but it's like, it's, we got, you know, just do what you can. Yeah. And bless her heart, she looked me dead in the eye and she said, okay. Yeah. And I was like, hmm, okay, great. You know, and that's when I realized the kids are far more resilient than any of us. Oh, yeah. Yes. You know, and, and you know, thank goodness they are because they just rode with it. And it was, yeah. again, they did whatever you asked them to do. And it was that delicate, I hope I'm not telling them to do something wrong here yeah. because they are doing exactly what I asked them to do. And, and, they, like, yeah. they're, and they're in the worst possible position with this whole thing. Oh, you it's know? crazy. Yeah, you, um, no, you feel so bad for all the all these kids that had to miss graduation, yes. miss senior years. Yep. But it's like, they're going to grow up and be so much more prepared for the world, you know? Uh, yeah. And, and it, like, if I hope they are. I really do, yeah. you know, but just seeing that it's like, I, I was hopeful for the future yeah. that we're going to, we're going to be okay. You know, it might take until this generation gets into places where they can influence things, yeah. yes. you know, that, that those, those are the ones who will be, you know, helping us out, you know, and I was very proud of them, but yeah. And so speaking of all, you know, music education and mm -hmm. teachers, I'm, I'm really curious to hear more about your time at, um, uh, Michigan and get, you know, getting your masters of percussion. I mean, that's no joke. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Yeah. You know, masters yeah, of percussion course. performance, right? Yeah. Yep, yeah. Percussion performance. Yeah. Uh, Cause um, we talked to a lot of different people on here. I, I would say majority of them, you know, probably are more drum set don't have that classical background. We just talked sure. to John Butterworth actually who did, mm -hmm. and you know, I do as well, awesome. but yeah. I think we're kind of the rarity, of you course, know, and yeah, I yeah. think it's always so interesting to hear Kaylee Moyer, you know, also yeah. in that, in that same okay. vein. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I'm, I'm definitely interested to hear more about how that's kind of influenced you know, where you are now. Yeah. As I mean, I obviously I studied pretty, ex pretty exclusively classical percussion at, yeah. at, in school. Um, so I was doing marimba literature, you know, auditioning, I was auditioning for orchestras for about three years. I was on the audition circuit. So at that point, did you, is your mindset like, I'm going to be in an orchestra and that's it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I yeah, was, that um, was the track. It was, you know, and it was obviously, yeah, I, I love doing, um, I love playing chamber music as well. Being at Michigan State and Central Michigan really instilled. Yeah, they love. have a great studio. They do. And do you remember some of those pieces? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Uh, trying to think. We did like Zanakis. We did. Uh, or, yeah. Um, we did. Uh, we did uh, the Pleiades. Okay. Um, yep. What was that? The last movement of Pleiades. The uh, Poe. Yeah. Classes. I never did that. I know what you're talking about. Yeah. That. And we all had to play to a click track, and um, <laughs> and it was it was wild. I mean, it was you know all these things you'd think would be exclusive to you know modern drum set performance, and we were playing to click tracks and yep. you know all this stuff. I played Poe. We uh, when we were at Central. This is grandma nerdy out about all this classic yeah. stuff. I haven't heard in a while about it. Um, yeah. We're at Central. It was uh, almost, not exclusively, but very close to exclusively a percussion orchestra school. So we were playing all the like 70s, 80s, 90s percussion ensemble literature from when um, a guy named Robert Honer was the professor. He was one mm -hmm. of the champions of um, like percussion orchestra. So there was like 11 or 12 of us in an ensemble at any Honer. given time. Robert Honer. Yeah. Is that... H O E or H E O rather? No, it's H O H N E R. Okay. I was yeah. I was like I was wondering if it was any relation to the music company. It's not. Mm, no, okay. it's a different different name. Yeah. Right. Yep. He pa he was the professor of Central Michigan mm -hmm. for a while until he passed away, and then my professor took over. He's retiring this year, so it's who's like, that? Uh, Andrew Spencer is his name. Okay, Doctor Spencer. Yeah, he's um, retiring and deservedly so. He's amazing. Yeah, incredible educator. Um, Talk about people who teach you how to love just learning things. Yeah. He's another one. You know, shout out to it. John Kinsey, right? Shout out to so John you, Kinsey. Yes. You met him at your time in Colorado? Uh, I met him. Right? Uh, I, I went to the festival that he worked at, uh, Colorado College okay. Summer Music Festival. And that was one of those summer institutes where you go for three weeks. You play in a festival orchestra yeah. with a bunch of other people that applied, auditioned, and won positions in the orchestra. And the time there was fully funded by private donors. Uh, so you had sponsors for the festival. So I didn't have to pay for room and board. My tuition there, everything was covered by a sponsor. Yep. Um, it's a wonderful program. I mean, it's an amazing opportunity for for folks, um, especially someone like me that didn't grow up playing orchestral music. As I, I grew up playing drum set, you know, I was a drum set kid. Mm -hmm. um, and then I got went to college and had to kind of learn. But yeah, I met John through that. And uh, he convinced me to move to Denver and give it a shot, you know, and just, mm -hmm. yeah, then it was really cool. He was a great mentor. And, yeah friend and um, so i was at pace yeah. last year just to fill you in and yeah. um so he's i think he's still the the colorado symphony right yeah principal percussion so because yeah. you know all those guys are there and, and he's a pearl endorser so mm, he is, yeah. i'd met him for the first time somehow i think probably just because he was like oh like you live in nashville and he he brought up kevin's name immediately <laughs> and just like oh my god that's you know awesome. kevin he's that's like awesome. he had nothing but great things to say about you oh my he's, um, he's such a kind man will you be back at pace this year 
I guess John will probably be back, but he might be. It just, yeah. just depends on his orchestra, his yeah. uh, performing schedule with the orchestra. Right. If they have a big concert planned, you know. With but you don't go anymore, right? I, I on your own. I didn't go. I went twice when I was in Colorado. Once yeah. was sponsored by University of Denver. I did a little extra schooling while I was out there, mm-hmm. and then the second time was on my own. But I, I didn't go. That, that was the last year before COVID hit, so um, I haven't been there since. Yeah. But I did go 2018, 19. I went back when I was at Central. We'd go every year and mm-hmm. spot. We had like a school funded bus and stuff yeah. like that. We'd pay for our hotel rooms. We'd get vans paid for by the yeah. school. That's how a lot of the kids end up going through yep. the studio. Absolutely. Yeah. But yeah, so I, I, I went there right before COVID, but I haven't been back since yet. Yeah, um, I can't. I'm going back this year. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was I was there last yeah. year, but this is going to be like kind of the revival of it. Yeah, definitely. So I'm back excited. To, back to being full PASIC mode. Yeah, yeah. 100%. It's so much fun. Yeah. So yeah, um, man. Um, I guess continuing in your story there, mm-hmm. like, at that point, so you're like fully on with the orchestral thing. Absolutely. You did, yeah. so you were two years at Central, then you went to Michigan for I, your master's? I did. Uh, was it four years? Uh, five years. Five uh, years. It was a music education track. Okay. And so I had to do yeah. an extra semester of classwork and then student teaching. Yeah. So I was I was auditioning for my master's program as well as student teaching and all yeah. that. Um, and then two years at Michigan State for the master's degree. And then I spent three years in Denver kind of doing like post-grad work, just essentially taking lessons from uh, John. At, mm-hmm. the, at his school out there is a, a Lamont School of Music yep. at the University of Denver and got a chance to just keep working with him and developing the orchestral side of things that I hadn't done a ton of work on back in Michigan. Yeah. So he really encouraged me to give that a shot. And so I did that circuit for about two or three years auditioning for orchestras wow. and stuff like that. And it was, it's so cool. I feel like most people you know, that meet you here, it's like they know you as like the rock drummer on Broadway. Yeah. And just like, you know, to hear that you're just an orchestral guy, like you were playing sure. in orchestras. <laughs> yeah. It's like, holy crap. Right. You know, yeah. It's, it's pretty cool. It's uh, <laughs> well, and it's funny. It's not as, I don't think it's as different a world as we make it out to be. And I'm sure, you know, just being in the classical side right. of things, it really isn't, it isn't a ton different. The principles all, they all blend, right. you know, yeah. timekeeping, sound production technique, yeah, equipment management, you know, schedule management, all that stuff, you yeah. know, um, music theories still used music it's, theory how well do you learn that was a big thing was the excerpt learning when you have to learn excerpts you know small bits of the big piece of music to audition for the orchestra mm-hmm. you have to learn them a certain you know certain way you have to bring out the certain elements of musicality and your job is to convince the committee behind your curtain when you're just playing a xylophone lick mm-hmm. to hear the rest of the orchestra behind you, wow. you know, convince them right like yeah the process That's intense is nuts. yeah, yeah it's, it, i will say that about the audition process the audition process for orchestras <laughs> are far beyond any audition process i've had for a drum yeah. set gig you know? so dive into that for me uh, okay. real quick. what what does that look like to okay to send that to you know like you said convince that yeah. that they're hearing the rest yeah and i and i should say i i never won a full time position in an orchestra you know i never got to that point and so yeah. you know and when I bring it up, I'm more just talking just about the experience. You yeah, know, I'm not, yeah. I definitely don't have the answers for how to win a position in an orchestra. Um, but I've got, you know, at least some ar- tools in the arsenal. And I think that's the biggest thing is having um, as many tools in your arsenal. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Because so, so many different orchestras are looking for different things. No two orchestras are alike. Right. You know, they are all trying to be their own brand of classical music, which I think is a beautiful thing. So the process being, you know, you're behind a curtain, the idea of taking out you know, gender bias. It's called a blind bias. audition. Right? Exactly. It's a yeah. blind audition. Absolutely. Because it really should be about the sound quality. I mean, that's absolutely that's yeah. the whole thing. And they lay down like a, a rug, like a big carpet on the floor next to like, where we'd be sitting in front of the instruments. So that way they can't hear like shoes clacking. Because even that sometimes will have influenced committees in the past. Like if they hear like heels clicking on a stage, right. that might, you know, say, oh, we don't, you know, want a woman in the orchestra, which is unfortunate. Yeah. Um, so, you know, all these things to take away bias and really ratchet up the tension, you know, <laughs> and you're yeah. just, don't make any noise, don't make any extra sound. You want to sound professional, you want to be professional. And then you go down each and every instrument and they list off two or three excerpts uh, from larger orchestral works. So there'll be maybe like 10 measures at a time. Some are 20 measures, some are just five, you know, little tiny licks. And you have to play these excerpts standalone with no orchestra behind you, just you on the stage on their concert hall, which was the cool part about the audition. I got to play on these wonderful halls, even if it were oh, just yeah. for an just audition. Historic, amazing places. Yeah. And I play like in Verizon Hall in Philadelphia yeah. for their orchestra at the Kaufman Center in Kansas City. Uh, Montreal had, a, had their stage for their orchestra. And that may be the most 
beautiful one I've ever played on. Mm. And uh, and the gear is usually provided, right? Yeah, the, from the percussion section. The big gear is yeah. so the mallet instruments. So you got vibraphones, marimbas, xylophones. Um, if you have like a bass drum, you have to play a bass drum excerpt or something like that. Timp <laughs> if you're a timpanist and you're auditioning, yeah. you don't have to fly your own timpani to the audition. Yeah. Right? You bring what concert snare drum, snare drum, sticks. yeah, snare drum, all your mallets, um, triangle, tambourine. You know, if you got the small little yeah. you know ticky tacky stuff, uh, you bring that. You know, any implements you want to use on the instruments. To make your noise, that's on you. Yeah. Um, but even the cymbals, you know, you go and play crash cymbal excerpts, they make you play their cymbals mm -hmm. so that there's less bias in sound. Right. You know. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so you have to go down the, you know, each instrument one by one and play the excerpts. And usually it takes about six minutes. Um, wow. So you have six minutes to convince this committee that your sound belongs in the orchestra. Wow. Essentially. And and it was always a solo audition, right? Like you were never put with like the percussion section, Correct. for example. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, some orchestras have started doing this thing where they'll actually have you play chamber music, like small ensemble music, hmm. as part of your audition yeah. with members from the section. Is that um, like a, maybe a later round or just That's like throughout, a finalist yeah. round, yeah, yeah. If you get way, way into the audition. Just to see, because a lot of orchestras are starting to do that now where they have these, one, these special events where they have... We're going to f focus the, on the, uh, we're going to feature the brass yeah. of the uh, orchestra. We're going to feature the percussionists and all yeah. that stuff. So they want to make sure that you gel and that you're, you know, fun to work with. And, you know, because at the end of the day, it's like, well, it's like Broadway. I mean, you think about Broadway and in a way it's very similar. I mean, I remember yeah. my first gig on Broadway was with, um, with the guitarists that I work with full time right now. And we're, yeah. you know, and um, wouldn't have imagined that the first gig I get here is someone I'm playing with still, you know. But it was a similar thing. It was the same feeling when I got there. It's like, I got to convince these guys on the first couple tunes. Because yeah. if I, it, you know, after the first song or two, if this guy's the right guy, you know, and yeah. um, it, at least that's just kind of how I've ended up seeing it at the end. It's like, you know, by the end of the first or second tune, it's like you get a vibe, you know, even if totally. it's a little uncomfortable, it's like you can hear something that you just can't put your finger on. Yeah. yeah. Um, intangibles. Intangibles. Yeah. yeah. And that's what ends up being with the orchestra stuff, too. It's a lot of intangibles. And you look at someone like John Kinsey, who whose job is to teach those, you know, and yeah. to, to figure out how to balance teaching those with the technique tangibles and the sound production tangibles, you know, yeah. what is concrete and what is not. But yeah, it's, it's very similar, right? Like, I mean, at least- Yeah, to I my, love that yeah. parallel. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I've never auditioned for sure. a professional orchestra. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I did audition for like, it's called the Empire State Youth Orchestra. Cool. We talked about nice. this back in my uh, background episode. SEO and uh, you want to say it? You say it. NISMA. You know NISMA? <laughs> I don't think I do. No. New York State no. School. Oh my God, am I going to mess it up? New York State School Music Association? NISMA. And yeah, it was yeah. all those, like you were saying, the INE competitions oh, and individual. Yep. That was quite a debacle when you said that to me the first time. That was. <laughs> You still have nightmares I, about that, right? Oh, I, I wake up in a cold sweat at least once a week. Like, hey, it's my <laughs> Okay, it's okay. You saw me as summoning a god. My therapist yeah, is yeah, like, don't yeah. worry, Nathan. There's no such thing as Nisma. Nisma yeah. can't hurt you. Yeah, yeah. But no, I totally. I mean, so much respect for you, and and obviously the you know the guys doing it full time. I mean, it's it's no, it's like a serious. There's so much detail and so much time and preparation. I remember being a yeah. kid and freaking out about those auditions. Yeah. And Absolutely. just being like so scared because you'd have these, ours were not blind. It mm -hmm. was just, you know, in a room and it's like these, these three guys, I think one of them was, I think my, my claim to fame is during my audition. I think one of the, it was like a guest judge mm -hmm. and he was actually in one of the orchestras. <laughs> Are you laughing? I'm just, I don't, when anyone starts with my claim to fame, I just, oh, my, no, I just, I just I, my I brain just, goes I just wild. remembered this, but <laughs> I, I crushed the audition. I mean, I made the ensemble, mm -hmm. but specifically that judge said he really, he said it was like one of the best snare drum performances mm -hmm. that he's heard in that kind of a setting. Yeah, I was like, that's cool. That, yeah, buddy. A, that's awesome. It's a great feeling when you yeah. get into a pressure situation like that and you come out the other side in one piece. Yeah. Is, yeah. you know, <laughs> the, the pressure is awful, but then if you do triumph over it, it's, it is better than any low pressure situation. Yeah. You know, as, these, as nice as those are. So yeah. how many auditions did you do for these and how, and how long does one audition What's the prep yeah. time like? I mean, is it, are we talking a few years in school for that one audition or is it like a few um, months, would you say? You know, I mean, like it, I, if you were to get kind of the philosophical about it, you know, you, you, you're always preparing for an audition. Right, right. Right. Um, but yeah, uh, but the actual audition doesn't get announced until like they don't announce that the position is open usually until about like, a couple months before the audition itself. Yeah. And that gives people time to send in their resumes. Because first you have to send in a, a paper resume that they look at and they screen those and then they pick the people who they want to come out and play. So they get 
500 people usually sending in resumes for one position. Yeah. And then they have to whittle that down to 50 yeah. uh, people who will actually come and play in the first round because they just don't have the time to hear everybody, you know. But I think it's, yeah, it's a few months out. They'll announce it and then you send in resumes. They'll put up the audition repertoire list usually when they announce the audition. So people can start preparing either way, you know. Right. They can, so the orchestra provide that list usually. Yes, the orchestra yeah. provides their own personalized, and every orchestra has a different list. Yeah, there's, and there's like standards, you know, right? That you yeah. more or less would see. Yeah, there's there's standards, you know, whatever it is. You know, of course, <laughs> just like just like Broadway bands saying, "What is a Broadway standard?" Yeah. Everybody has a different right opinion of what a Broadway yeah. standard is, you know, or what the standard list is. So you'll see a ton of crossover, and then you'll see this one in there, and it's like, I have no idea what this is, yeah. you know, and it's not available in any of the books of excerpts because it's not. Published public domain. It's one of these newer, a lot, some of these orchestras like Philadelphia auditioned for them for a substitute position. And I ended up seeing a list that they had for their associate principal percussion audition list. And they were asking you to play excerpts from like John Williams, uh, Sorcerer's Stone hmm. soundtrack because hmm. they do so much, you know, concerts for people like that, right? They do yeah. these movie scores with the orchestras. They need to know that you can handle that stuff because yeah. those scores are no joke as you know, you yeah. know. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, it's usually a few months for one audition, you know, and if you get accepted through the resume round, then they, you know, say, okay, here's an updated list if they change it, that kind of thing. And then um, getting your travel in order, you have to go fly out to this gig, you have to pay for the flight, you have to pay for your room and board, you stay with somebody in town if you know somebody in town. And I think that's the craziest part is you prepare for months for this audition and most of the time you play the first round and you get cut. And yeah. the first round audition is usually about five minutes. <laughs> right. So you prepare, mm -hmm. you play for five minutes and you're done, you know, unless yeah. you advance to the next round and then maybe you play for 15 minutes, you know, and if you're lucky, you get to that final round and you play for 45 minutes, you know, they want to hear everything you can do right. and give you all this opportunity to show off your musicality and things like that. But yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's about a few months or so yeah. each time you get an audition. Sometimes you have multiple ones to prepare for, you know, one audition's happening on this date, you got another audition that next month two totally different lists, two totally different prep styles, all that kind of thing too. So yeah. it's, um, yeah. yeah, that that's the, that maybe is where it gets to be the toughest when you're having to juggle most, like multiple lists yeah. and things like that. For sure. And did you say you were a sub for the Colorado Symphony? Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, then I was like, I was very lucky when I left um, the school, I was done doing my, you know, in school lessons with John, I always learned from him. Um, and he asked me, you know, are you gonna be around? Are you planning on moving somewhere? And I said, well, unless an, an audition, goes well and I win a position, I'll, I'll be in Colorado. And he said, well, we're looking to make you one of our first calls. You yeah. know, like put you up wow. at the, kind of the top of the That's list. Awesome. And um, and it was great because I loved everybody in that orchestra. I mean, really, yeah. um, that section felt like family. You know, they really yeah. did. And uh, did you ever meet, uh, did you ever meet Steve Hearn? He's also a I don't think I've met him. He he had my boss's job, I believe, for a while. Yes, he did. Yeah, he um, lived here in Nashville. He's like the nicest guy. Yeah, I think I'm Facebook friends with him. Yeah, but I've met him. He lived here in Nashville too, and he's yeah. a, a section percussion assistant principal timpani. Mm -hmm. You talk about a guy that does everything, yeah. you know, and he like he can step into just about any section of that percussion section and just snail it, fire, yeah. yeah, like drum set. I mean, he's one of the best drum set players I've ever met, hmm. you know, and he's in the in the middle of a you know in the round concert style hall where there's no funneling, you know, the, the sound is just going straight up and there's no way to keep time. And yeah. he's back there on the drum set, just beating the crap out of it, <laughs> just driving the band, man. It's yeah. so cool to see it, you know, wow. really cool to watch, you know. Uh, so being in that section was a life experience, Yeah, you know, just going in there. And, and I guess it taught me, big thing it taught me too, was how you can have a job, but it doesn't have to dominate your life mm. either. Um, you know, cause you get in school and it's, it is every day, eight hours you're practicing. Yeah. in a practice room by yourself. You know, we all still practice, obviously, in our room by ourselves, but it was cool to see them get these jobs and, you know, live somewhat normal lives. You know, the kids, families, that kind of thing. They all, they all had hobbies. They all did stuff outside of work and stuff like that. But they come in, you know, we're all dressed in our street clothes. and But then they start playing and they transform into, you know, these makers of music and, yeah, and right. things like that. And it's like, it's just heard that reminder, you know. Yeah, that, I felt you know. that same way because I met a bunch of those guys at PASIC yeah. and like, you know, Leo Soto? Yeah. He's yeah, yeah, principal for, with Houston's, or maybe he's not the principal, but. Uh, timpanist for Houston, if I remember Houston correctly, Houston right? yeah. yeah. He's, mm -hmm. And he's someone that I always want to meet just with my position. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, just like the coolest guy, like yeah. get a drink with him and all these guys, you, you would never guess that they're like 
yeah. freaking masters of, of their instruments, you know, I, just I think those so are proficient. The, those are the best ones, right? Yeah. Like you walk in the room, you don't see them. Just wizards. You can't Sleeper. tell. You can't tell a difference yeah. from the rest of the room. Some of them look, look like my dad, you know. So yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Very unassuming. They dress normally. I do like <laughs> someone that you have no idea. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I, I like that with everything, and I love I love that in the in the realm of weightlifting, in the realm of martial arts. Anybody where you, you look at them, you don't know that they're a beast. You're like, yeah. That's because I remember I had a personal trainer at one point and I was like, yeah, I want to be strong, but I don't want to look strong. He was like, oh, you want to be a sleeper? Like, a sleeper. <laughs> yes. There's a, yeah. You have a word for that? that I'm like, that's the, that's the, whatever that is, yeah. that's what I want. Yeah, like, he's like, here, drink awesome. this. Yeah, yeah. Here, drink these drugs. <laughs> have, fun, uh, have fun being a sleeper. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> <Jeez>. <laughs> uh, yeah that's that's. Those are my favorite. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. It, well, it, and it suggests this ver this security with themselves, right? Yes. That they don't have to go out and tell. And that yeah. is, you know, bringing it around to Nashville. One of my favorite parts about Nashville oh, yeah. is sure. you don't know half the time right. who in the room with you is yeah. one of these guys. And I think that's awesome. You know, I don't think it needs to be that way where... There's never an, an ego or yeah. anything. You know? No, the ego is completely absent. It's such a wonderful thing, you know, and it's... Whenever uh, you encounter yeah. someone that feels the need to assert that, it, well, not whenever, but it is the exception to the rule that someone feels the need to assert that when they're actually something. Usually if you're the shit, you don't care. Right. Like, you're like yeah, whatever. Absolutely. I had, yeah. I had someone last night try to get on stage wanted to pay 20 bucks to be on stage. I was like, mm. it's a hundred bucks to be on stage. Yeah. yeah. And the guy standing with him was, you don't know who he is. And I said, nope, I don't care. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. here's the thing. Everybody who is somebody is willing yeah. to do like, oh yeah, man, no Wait, they no were trying problem. to play drums? Yeah, they're trying to get on stage. I don't know, know you could like, yeah. pay to play like that. Oh yeah. yeah. On not a, not at every venue. Yeah. Like, yeah. Some venues don't allow it for insurance, but right. hmm. that at Tootsie's you absolutely can. It's mm. up to the band. But yeah. <laughs> I'm like, no, dude, you're not. Yeah. You don't. You don't even know who he is. I'm like, right. I don't care who he is. If he was uh, somebody that I should care about, I would know. <laughs> he, he, I'd either know, or they would be willing. They'd be like, yeah, man, no problem, because yeah. Yeah. They'd be cool. they've been through this shit too. Yeah. Um, obviously, he hasn't. So, yeah. fuck off. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. From the bird, right? Yeah. I'm just like I think. Um, speaking of ego and talking about the orchestra, you reminded me. Uh, my my favorite moment with the orchestra, with subbing with them, kind of you know. You know, yeah. bring it all together. But yeah. uh, my favorite moment with the orchestra is I got to play at Red Rocks with them. Oh, oh so awesome. Cool. I got to play Red Rocks with the oh symphony. I got. I was lucky enough to be one of their calls for this concert. <laughs> and they were backing up Weird Al Yankovic. What? <laughs> yes! <laughs> it was amazing. Oh, yeah. my it God! Was, yeah, like you take, if there's, hey, who would you want to play with at Red Rocks? And it's like, yeah. uh, duh. Yeah. Um, you know, and it was so funny. Um talking to my, my neighbor uh, percussionist who was like a couple years older than me and he had won a position in the symphony and he was you know just just a couple years old so around that you know 30 31 and uh, i remember standing on the stage uh in rehearsal getting ready to set up for the rehearsal and he looks at me and said did you ever listen to weird Al's music growing up i looked at him i said absolutely yeah. <laughs> and he looks back at me and says i know every word to his songs yeah, and he's like yes. don't tell anybody <laughs> i was like no, i won't promise you know but it was wild because you know he comes out and he's doing his rehearsal and he's doing all his show stuff and and we went backstage and we had they have catering services at red rocks you just go right in the back of the stage and it's one of the best catering services in the world like ridiculous big surprise yeah, yeah you, you know it's it's you, you you would think they would sometimes they just don't you know right but yeah. they do you know they make it the best and um we're sitting there and there's this table this open table weird Al sits down at the table and it's him and his manager and he i don't think looked up once from his food hmm. and it was just very insular oh, weird very so he, quiet. he was and um no personality and no not even so much like no personality it wasn't even like rude yeah i, I did not get one rude vibe from this man he's probably the, i think he really is generally maybe the nicest famous person in the world he is i really and i think yeah. part of that is i mean that's got to wear on someone you know what i mean and like looking at you know the orchestra and they're all you know talking and sitting at tables and conversing and they're you know he's there at the table by himself you know on his tour and all that and he's with his manager you know yeah. and it was wild to see that you know coming to a place where the industry is the industry and it's the city you know yeah. It, it, it kind of, it's an interesting perspective, you know, and I, I feel that some days yeah. of, you know, you get off stage and it's like, okay, I'm, I'm going home, you yeah. know, and when you get done playing with the orchestra, it's a very similar thing where you're done with the concert, you know, you're on the stage, you're in your suits and, you know, everyone applauds, you stand up, you know, you recognize the applause at the end of the, the program. Mm -hmm. Lights come up, we all walk off stage, go to the locker rooms, change into day clothes, we go out <laughs> the back door and you blend right into the rest of the Yeah, the game's over. Wouldn't even know, you yeah. know, you wouldn't even know how these people were in the center. You've done your playing. job and not... 
Yeah. Go home. And man. you wouldn't even know that, that they're playing. And it's like they go home and they come back the next day and do it. And it was this kind of a surreal experience every single time I played with that orchestra. Yeah. Of just like, yeah, I'm just a normal person. Like, was that for you, you not, kind of like a I've arrived moment? Wasn't even an I've like, arrived moment. It was a reminder that no matter if you've arrived or not, yeah. you're just another person. Right. Oh, At that. the end of yeah. the day, you're just another person. That's wonderful. It was yeah. be- yeah, in, in a beautiful way, right? Yeah. It's, a, it's a very calming, very, you know, centering feeling of no matter what man like and then that goes both ways it's like hey man you got a big ego you got to remember you're just another person but then there's also like if you feel like you're screwing stuff up or you feel like you're just man i'm just not doing it today and then you get done and it's like i'm just another guy yeah, yeah. I'm just, I, but i gotta i gotta pick <laughs> up milk on the way home yeah, yeah i, get, yeah, I get done playing a four-hour set and everyone's like you're the best band ever and it's like yeah but i i forgot to shut off my stove you know yeah. <laughs> i forgot yeah. to you know my my dishwasher leaked yesterday and yeah. Yeah, I felt very human in that moment. You yeah, know? I did not feel like anything, like I've made it in any way, you know? And it's yeah. like, uh, there's humbling moments all the time, you know? And especially watching someone like him, even just having to be that quiet, you know? It was wild. Yeah. You know, and I, I was just part of me wanted to go up and ask him for an autograph. And then I saw that and I was <laughs> like, you know what? That's probably the rudest thing I could do right now. Yeah. Mm. Like, no, this is enough. Me seeing him and getting to play on the same stage. Getting to play with him. That yeah. is more than enough. I don't need yeah. to get him to sign something for proof. It's like, no, yeah. man, that's living, you have the story that's living with me, you know man. Yeah. Right. You know, that is going right here. Yeah. The best part was I played maybe the first couple tunes and that's all they needed the extra percussion part for. So What tunes did you play? It was his intro song and I think it was Amish Paradise. <laughs> I played Glockenspiel on Amish Paradise. Oh my God. Okay. We need Talk a video right. of that. Nerding out. I've peaked. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, it's only down from here. <laughs> that's it. It's done. And um, but the cool thing was after that, I was done. And I remember one of the percussionists in the orchestra says, "Hey, it's really cool. Like you'll be done after the second tune. You don't have to stick around. Like when you're, when you're done with anything, even at your regular concert, you know, if you play just on the first tune of their concert." Mm-hmm. You're done. You don't have to stay, and you get paid the same amount, huh. which is kind of wild. So they don't expect you to help with tear down or anything. Uh, it's union, so oh. they have stage hands do everything for you, except for the yeah. small stuff, of course. Right, but right. no, if you're done, and unless unless I think at the last concert, you stick around to grab your stuff, you yeah. know, or you just do it, or you do it at the intermission, mm-hmm. and then you're done. And uh, so but, you just enjoyed the rest of that concert, then? Oh yeah, I did yeah. not go home. You know, he was like, <laughs> "You can beat the Red Rocks traffic." I'm like, "What the hell are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, I want to stay in the Red like, Rocks. I'm <laughs> in Red about? Rocks. I'm going to spend as much time as I can in Red yeah. Rocks." You know, and I they had the they have staircases on the sides of the stage in the back, um, and they built the dressing rooms into the rock. So like the 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 dressing rooms are cool. literally. Yeah, I need to get there. It's ridiculous. Man. Taylor's been there. Have you been there? Yeah. No. No. Never been. That's come up a few times. It's but, it's yeah. funny because like I don't really necessarily I haven't yeah. had like because I've been asked like what's like bucket list venue for you I'm like I don't know but now after enough of these thing, conversations have happened yeah, like pictures. Okay, well, okay that's. <laughs> That's on there. I gotta yeah. pl- gotta it play is, Red Rocks. It is hundred yeah. percent as advertised. Yeah, just ridiculous. And you know, and you're standing on the stage, and the seats are just vaulted. You know, just up into the mountain. Do you know the capacity about? Uh, five or six thousand. Okay, so, I mean, it's all bench seating, so it's you yeah. know somewhat flexible. But um, I think they sell. I think five or six thousand is their capacity. Yeah. But yeah, and they so they had these staircases going up into these dressing rooms, and I stood on that staircase from up above backstage right about here just looking down on the stage watching it and watching in between every single song Weird Al runs off the stage and a team of four people rip the costume off and put a new costume on in 30 seconds (laughs) and he is back out for his next song dressed like the song it's stupid (laughs) it's amazing can you imagine if they did that for you guys with the bow ties right (laughs) yeah yeah, seriously (laughs) it's like yeah okay for this piece you have to be wearing you know all black and this piece you have to be wearing a tuxedo and this piece you're wearing a swimsuit you know it's like this one you're wearing your aloha shirt and the next one you're going to be wearing a fat costume exactly yeah, that's... yeah but i'm playing triangle why do i need... yeah, right. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense yeah that's... it's yeah this the dedication is just stupid man. yeah yeah it was the same when i i saw him in reading back a million years ago i, mm-hmm. I got front row center <laughs> no way. so it was it was the best and during during that's your horoscope for today <laughs> what he's like looking the most manic you a human can possibly look and there's that moment where the person, all your friends are laughing behind your back. Kill them. <laughs> he 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 looked directly into my eyes and imbued That's me with some of his powers and a lot of his weirdness, and I've been blessed by it ever since. That makes sense. Oh, That's yeah. why you're weird. Yeah, it's because of Weird Al. Yeah. That's a deep running with scissors cut. Weird. I didn't expect to talk about Weird Al today. That's great. <laughs> I actually have. Do you know um, Alex Dolezal? I don't think so. No. Piano player here in town. He okay. actually runs a, a comedy night. One of the funniest and sweetest human beings here. Fantastic musician. He has a running joke mm. 
on his Instagram every Thursday, TBT when I met Weird Al, and it's it's a picture of of, of him with Weird Al. Yeah, and he tags Weird Al, and every and he's like, I'm going to do. He's been doing it for years. He's like, I'm doing it until he notices. I'm like, yeah. I, that's um. So I I need to find a way. Yeah. I I want to do because uh, I saw that Weird Al did some birthday shout out for mm-hmm. someone. I'm like, I want to find need to that. Find out, yeah. yeah. What what that costs? Cameo. You get him a cameo from Weird Al. Say, hey, I noticed. Be like I just be like I need to have him be like, hey, for his so for his next birthday, be like, okay, this is the thing, and you got you have to say, yeah, that you saw the thing. Like that's that would be that's the move. Yeah. But you can so many people do that. Like huh? uh, those cameos, you can get just about anybody to do those things for the right if it's the right price, right, you right, know, yeah. and, right. and like depending on their tier, I guess, of right, cost, you know. What's that you said? You want to learn how to play drums, but you don't know where to begin? Let me humbly suggest to you that you head on down to Music Lab Nashville and you talk to their crew of fantastic teachers and you jump on in and start your music journey right there. Don't want to learn drums? Want to learn guitar? Ukulele? Mandolin? Trumpet? Vocals? Keys? Sitar? Maybe not sitar, but all that other stuff for sure. Visit nashville.musiclab.co to learn more and sign up for a free trial lesson. Okay, so I have to ask. Yes. Uh, and I think we can probably move on from the orchestral stuff. Or, yeah. You know, I'm definitely still interested to learn more, you know, if you have other stories we'll, uh, or whatever. We'll talk over yeah, man. Um, about bourbon whenever Nathan remembers. Bourbon, yeah. yeah. Just quick, like, obviously yeah. as a orchestral percussionist and you're doing these additions, like, you have to be prepared on every instrument, right? Mm-hmm. Did you gravitate towards, like, a specific thing? Like, you mentioned glockenspiel, mallets, yeah. snare drum, well, bass drum. I, you know, it's funny, actually, um, I would say and I didn't necessarily gravitate to one specific instrument because you had to kind of know everyone pretty equally. And so there's something to love about all of them. Yeah. That's a really cheap answer. Like for but, me, uh, with my story, I mm-hmm. told you like snare drum was like, snare drum, I think because yeah. I was a drum set guy. So it was a natural Absolutely. to take out the, the snare from the kit and yeah. you have that. I think I gravitated so. towards more of like a type of music. And okay. it was it was like playing in chamber ensembles yeah. like that. If I could have done that, and it just shows now that I'm playing in bands for full, full time, you know, I mean, if I could have done that for a living, Honestly, like the orchestras were great, but if I could have played in a small, like four person chamber ensemble, like so percussion, dude, yes, um, you know, I want to sandbox, one. I still would love to do that, yeah, and like sandbox percussion, like all those guys, like they are, I, I respect those guys so much, yeah, you know? sandbox is insane. Oh my god, it, it, all those, yeah, third you watch coast. seven pillars. Have you seen their I saw it live at PASIC. You got it, you got to watch that this. was the premiere, yeah, all your, dude, all your the polyrhythm you stuff, get, all that, dude, you are, you have yes, no idea you got to watch this, man. What are, what I'm, I'm taking for. notes. This, <laughs> yeah. is, this is my note. What, what are they called? Seven pillars. Well, specifically that, but sandbox yeah. percussion. I'll send you okay. some yeah. of these groups. If you want to pick one of them, I'd say probably four is probably the the, the big hit. You know, oh Pillar yeah, four. Yeah, that was the one that was. Uh, it's by a composer named uh, Andy Akio. Yeah, and, that guy. Um, anything that guy touches turns to gold. Dude, I mean, yeah, talking about a brain man. Like uh, yeah. he's got a mind on him. He's, and they're all young. I mean, Andy's pretty young. Sandbox is young. Mm-hmm. You yeah. look at some of those pioneers, like you know, Third Coast Percussion. Yeah. And so and they, were Nexus, all, they were all like, young when they did that. Stuff. That's the cool I'm thing. Taking, like, you know, Amadinda? Uh, yeah. They're, absolutely. they're doing one of the showcase concerts this year. No way. So we got a whole list of gear that we're going to yeah. help them out for. Gotta see the, uh, they better play Jose before John. They yeah, got to oh, play yeah. Jose before John. You said yeah. Nexus Percussion, too? Nexus, Nexus yeah, yeah. They're retired. Chain, yeah, let's chain. continue on with your journey. I'm, I'm just yeah. so fascinated with your background. So you mentioned you're studying with John. Mm-hmm. So talk to us about that transition. You know, you're going through those auditions. Um, yeah. You had that amazing, you know, substitute gig yeah. with the symphony. And because um, you said John was the one that convinced you to move to Nashville, right? Or um, he kind of pushed you, you said? Yeah. I, I mean, I, yeah, there's, there's a lot of kind of, I think everyone, everybody here I've met in Nashville has a reason for being here. That's not music related. Hmm. It seems yeah. like everybody's got a story. Before, but like, yeah. like, I don't know. Everyone seems to have a story. Like everyone I've talked to has like a real, like, yeah, I was doing this thing back in my hometown and then something happened, you know, it really pushed me to go to Nashville. And um, COVID was tough, you know, for everybody, I think, you know, and for musicians everywhere. And I was not excluded from that. You know, it was, it was really difficult. And there was, you know, there's just, there's kind of a tough time, you know, overall. And I had, uh, I just recently started playing at a church out there, playing drum set for a, for a modern church, you know, kind of worship. Uh, got to know some of them kind of briefly. It was just kind of starting to get to know them. And uh, and then COVID hit. I was playing with the orchestras. All those concerts got shut down. 
Yeah. I mean, all these cool programs. Yeah, the orchestra's got hit probably hardest, you know Big I mean? time, man. And they're still recovering. You yeah. Know, a, lot of, a lot of them are still recovering. Um, yeah. And, you know, there are all these things that I was looking forward to. Yeah, I think everybody, you know, all these things, all these things. And I had this, this chamber ensemble, like I was talking about with a friend of mine, Ben. And we had uh, three weeks before come off of a tour. And we got in just at the last minute. Like hmm. it wouldn't have even happened. Yeah. You know, if we had scheduled our tour a month later, never would have happened. Hmm. You know, and we toured some colleges and toured some like public spaces and stuff like that and played our program. And we were really exploring at the time, you know, music and voice, you know, percussion and voice, how we can like incorporate you know, speaking things and you know, that kind of stuff into our program and stuff like that with mm -hmm. playing, you know, percussion stuff. And um, I took the Kansas City Symphony audition. And then I think it was like five days after I took that audition, everything started to shut down. Yeah. You know, long story short is, you know, I hit July and August around the time when I'm thinking, okay, by that point, we'll all figure this out. We'll figure out what's going on and, you know, we'll, we'll move on and blah, 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 blah. And of course that didn't happen. And the orchestra was like, you know, we're not really starting up a season. It's going to be a truncated season. And we, because of that, we're, doing smaller ensembles, spaced out ensembles. We don't need our subs as much, you know? And so it's like, I don't even know when this is going to happen. You yeah. know, who knows when this will happen, if ever. Um, and that at the time, you know, of course, now we know that they've started back up and a lot of them are functioning well. A lot of them have gotten back, you know, into yeah. their regular programming. But at that time it was a, I don't know if this is ever going to happen, you know? And it mm. was, I remember vividly July, August um, of 2020 sitting in my room and not making music. Yeah. And I was like, this is not right. You know, yeah. there's got to be something I can do. And I, in a moment of pure desperation, I went onto Craigslist <laughs> and was As like, one does. I have heard, I was like, I heard some of my friends found gigs doing this. And I was like, I'm going to give this a shot, you know? And so I look up, you know, drum set, you know, all that, you know, just drummer, drum set, whatever. <laughs> and one of the searches I did turned up, I remember third result and it was, you know, working band needs a drummer. And I clicked on it, it all caps, you know, I'm thinking, okay, we'll see, you know, but I click on it and it seems legit. It doesn't seem like a fake ad. It doesn't seem like they're lying. It seems like, no, they're serious. They have some gigs lined up yeah. at places that are allowing limited capacity type stuff. And I was like, cool, let's see what this is. And it was, uh, it was a band called Final Eyes, um, spelled out Final Eyes. Yep. And it was this group of like middle-aged people, like 40, 50 year olds in a five piece band. And they had made their living for years on the side doing these wedding band gigs and mm. these corporate gigs and these bar gigs. And and they were still trying to work. You know, yeah. they were still trying to have gigs, you know. And it was, um, you know, I was surrounded by a lot of people that weren't working, you know, and just couldn't or didn't want to, either one, you know. And they were. And I was like, I still want to go out and do something, you know, what if, in whatever context I can do it in at this point, you know. And they said, well, come on over. Here's, you know, here's, go check out our song list. And and, uh, and that was back in Colorado. Right? That was back in Denver. Yeah. yeah. And, um, you know, I, I had contemplated moving to Denver back in 2019. I was thinking about moving in 2020 and it kind of like, you know, put the kibosh to things. And uh, so I go and audition for this band and they're like, you know, bring some tunes. And they, but one specific thing they told me was they said, we're looking for someone who can sing some songs. And I was uh. like, well, I can sing. I've sung before. Like, I don't, I don't guess I've never really done the drumming singing thing before, but yeah, I'll give it a shot. Like I'll pick some songs that I know really well. And one of the ones that they had on, they had a bunch of normal, you know, Jesse's girl and, uh, you know, summer 69 and all these tunes. And so I picked a couple of normal and they had hold the line by Toto on the list. <laughs> and I was like, dude, I got to do this. I love that song. You know, yeah. and I know it just note for note. I, yeah. I grew up, it was one of my favorite songs growing up as a kid. And I was like, yeah, why not? Let's see if they know how to play it. And I get there and I remember is, uh, he's like, Oh, really sorry. Our keyboard and bassist player couldn't make it, but me the guitarist and the singer their husband and wife and they're like well, we're here you know we can do whatever you need to do let's see how you do and it was me on an electric kit in their basement him on his guitar her with her microphone the little pa system in their basement and they're like well what do you want to play and i was like i saw you do toto on there and they're like you want to play toto and i was like yeah i want to play Toto. do you know and he's like well we don't have the keyboard player we'll just like skip the intro you know the intro is all piano and we'll skip that and so i just played it and sang it and you know as best as i could and you know, I remember a few months down the road after they said I could be in the band and play with them. And I realized that it was me and a, four other middle-aged people, you know, but they were working and they were doing everything they could to still work, you know, within the context of what we had, you yeah. know, and with the situation in Denver. And it was like these, these wonderful, you know, people, you know, 20 years, my senior with all this life and energy. Yeah. And it was like, it picked me out of my doldrums immediately, yeah. you know, and it gave me something to do. And it gave me a challenge. Like it gave me a challenge to really practice that skill, 
you know, something I'd never done before. And like, I was able to sing some songs that they just, you know, the female singer couldn't sing or something like that, or the one other male singer couldn't sing. So it could help round out their set, mm -hmm. you know? And it was like, we got two months into the gig and they had hired a brand new bass player and keyboard to find out that they were thinking of disbanding this band. Like they were like, we didn't like the lineup we had before. And the guitar player was like, I'm just kind of sick of it. Let's just not do this. And his wife was like, no, you know what? Give it one more shot. Let's find a new drummer. Let's find a new bassist and keyboard. Let's just give it one more shot. If it doesn't work out, we're done. You know, we'll call yeah. it quits. And those people are family to me still. And <laughs> Randy passed away in September, the guitar player. Mm -hmm. And it was a tough, it was a tough time. Wow. Um, but they're family, you know, I mean, they really are. I mean, they yeah. became just like, we did almost, you know, we were always rehearsing. We rehearsed once a week and, you know, and started adding tunes like, maybe we can do this song. Maybe we can do this song. Maybe we can do this song. And it was like, yeah, you know, everyone would just come every week, just bring a new song to the table. Yeah. They always wanted to play and you just happen to now be in a band that can handle it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it all like, covers. You all said? covers. Yeah. yeah. And we were sure to like come sail away because we had a keyboard player and he had downloaded the actual synth patch that Dennis DeYoung used on the <laughs> nice. album. And so it's like, we're doing everything to the record, you know, and it's again, that instilling all these things that when you come out here, you, you kind of need to have that, you know, from the start, you know, with the Broadway gigs is like learning tunes, you know, accurately and quickly. And they forced me to do that. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it was like, we got a gig, we're going to learn these, you know, 10 tunes for the next gig and, you know, and all this stuff. And it's two days away. But yeah, that was kind of the transition point was that. And it was, there was no other work happening. And I kind of had to just take what I could get. Yeah. And it ended up being work where I was sitting there. I'm like, and I was talking to a therapist at the time. And I remember a conversation with her where she, you know, we were talking about why are you here in these appointments? And I was like, well, you know, I had a lot of plans and COVID shut them down. And uh, I'm trying to figure out how to kind of rationalize and deal with this and, and um, mentally handle it and, you know, all this stuff. And uh, I said, you know, I had plans to kind of move to Nashville and that kind of really put the kibosh to it. I don't think, you know, it's not going to happen, you know. And she said, yeah, this, this time has definitely killed a lot of plans. She said, on the other hand, this could accelerate your plans. And I was like, oh, I hadn't thought about it that way. <laughs> yeah. And I started to realize with all of this stuff not happening, it was not like I was having to necessarily cut as thick of a tie in a lot of ways. And I didn't feel like I had to cut the ties. You know, mm -hmm. and, and there are a lot of the, you know, the kind of like explaining, almost like explaining yourself or rationally. It's like, look, it, I have to go where I think the work is going to be. And yeah. at the time it was like, I think I can probably find more work in like certain work in Nashville. And this, I think is it, you know, this is the time. And again, it landed the day I moved was the first day Denver really started to open back up. Um, you know, and I'm, I was like, it was like four months after I joined this band and I'm telling them, yeah, I think I'm moving to Nashville. And they're like, what are you talking about? <laughs> like, what do you mean you're leaving? You know, yeah. you just joined. Yeah. You're having so much fun. And I was like, yeah, that was the one, that was the one like active, really active yeah. at the moment. Ty, it wasn't like yeah. the symphony wasn't active. And I had to say goodbye to John and Steve and all those guys. And that was hard. Mm -hmm. But it was also just like, it's, these things aren't happening. I don't know what my school job is going to look like next year. I might not have a job next year. Yeah. You know, I have to go where I think I can find those things. So it really, it was, it was, born out of necessity first. And then I realized, God, I really love doing this. Yeah. You know, oh my gosh, I, I gotta, I gotta go do this. You yeah. know? And they gave me this new, they helped me find this kind of space in the world that I didn't really have before. I felt like I didn't have before, you know, yeah. it's really, it's really cool. Like I owe a lot to those guys. Wow. What yeah. a, what a cool story, man. Yeah. Always thank, respect thank you for elders, sharing man, that. I you mean, know? Yep. Wow. I was thinking a lot about different things when you were sharing that, just yeah. being vulnerable and like, but good on you for being so open-minded. It's like you were literally at the pit of your despair, just not, you had nothing going on. And yeah. And, you and, know, and it was like, you know, you don't have a choice. You don't have a choice at those times. Yeah. You know, you have to be open-minded. You have to be like, well, okay, where, what's going to happen? You don't know what's happening next. I mean, that's the ultimate and having to be flexible, right? You know, yeah. being willing to sing. It's like, so much fun. Though, yeah. Man. Oh my and gosh, now look yeah. at you, right? That's, I mean, that's what you're doing now, right? Like, yeah. you're, you're actively singing and drumming. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. That's crazy. It's so much yeah. fun, though. It's a lot, it's a lot so of you, fun. I mean, you kind of found yourself in yeah. those those dark times it sounds like before moving here yeah right? yeah um it was it was definitely they definitely gave me the chance to like try something new yeah without real with with that safety net of don't worry it's okay if it doesn't work yeah you know i mean it's just totally cool yeah i mean like we're all trying to figure this out you know and then once you figure it out just allowing me to roll with it too you know yeah I mean? and allowing me to have that voice you know and i think that like i was thinking about on the way over preparing as much as i could on my end for you guys too but um you know, I, th I think every drummer should try singing like at some point in their lives, even if it's not while they're drumming. Yeah. You know, they should just, yeah. just, just try it, you know, and, and just give it a shot. You know, you'd, you'd be amazed 
some of the drummers who I've met up and they're like, I don't really sing. And then they put a microphone in front of me. And I'm like, dude, you sound amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And like, how have you not done this yet? (laughs) You know, not all marketability and job, you know, situation money wise aside of like, you'll be more applicable and hireable. It's like, no, forget that part of it. It's like, there's no, it's so much more fun to sing a song at at times, you know, and in doing so too, it teaches you a totally different way to learn a song. Yes, it does. You, you listen to the vocal. If you listen to the vocal first, it's amazing. You learn the form of the song immediately. Mm. You know, the drum, you listen to the drum part, it's, you can feel it and, and, and all that, you know, but that that vocalist drives a lot of the form and like, where's this going? Can I, can I detect the energy? Like when I'm on stage, I don't necessarily read charts. Right. Um, I pull up AZ lyrics and I read lyrics off mm. of the page and you can yep. see the sections and you can see where where's the repeated text. You know, okay, here's the repeated text. That must be the chorus. There's the title of the song. That must be the chorus. So when I see that text coming up, it's almost like playing karaoke. You see the like highlighted yeah. text coming. Yep. It's like, here it comes, here it comes. This is going to be it. This is going to be it. So at least you get, you get to that point faster, I think, even in some yeah. ways, in some ways. Yeah. And then you can jump on the chorus and, you know, lay it and know that you're going to hit that chorus and stuff like that. And it, it sets you up for the like, oh, there's an extra bar here. But at least you knew that that turn was coming and you knew that weird things happened in that turn. Yes. Anyway, yeah. So yeah, I would just say to anyone who's a drummer is listening or anybody really, I mean, any instrumentalist, like just try singing. Yeah. I mean, it's so much fun. Yeah. You know? Well, and, and you can, this made me think this, yeah. uh, singers often, and I think rightfully so in a lot of cases get roasted for like lack of understanding of rhythmic things and, and being kind of all over the place mm-hmm. with rhythms but they learn, like you said, you you yeah. brought it up. They they learn songs differently, and like totally. and putting yourself in that singer headspace. Just like when I first started, because I would not call myself like an excellent bassist by any any stretch. Yeah. But when I first started picking up bass, yeah, and just just from picking it up, going, oh, I know what I would want from a drummer. Yep, absolutely. I, I know what I I know yeah. what I would want, so I'm not gonna. I'm not going to ruin that for any yeah. bass player I'm playing with. I'm yeah. like, I really want to make sure I'm and, providing and, yeah. that thing. Absolutely. Do, doing that as a singer is going to let you know what a singer is going to want from a drummer. Yeah. Yeah. That's like, so it, valuable. It's, it's, it feeds the other thing. It's all synergistic. It's yeah. a beautiful thing. Yeah. And like shout and, you know, quick shout out to my bandmates of like, you know, Shannon and Shannon Sproul and Brian Snyder for, again, allowing me to figure some of this out on the job and like, you know, doing things that, you know, they wouldn't have done in the past or, you know, and then, and then just being so open, you know what I mean? And like, just yeah. being so willing to work with me and then like understand it. And, you know, and I always try to make sure I understand, you know, what is Ryan doing on his guitar? What strings are you using? Like, what is your pickup situation? What is your, this and that? Like, I want to know what sounds he's producing. You know, it's yeah. the learning thing, right? It's, it all comes back to learning where, you know, and the singer too, of just like, you know, trying to make sure I know exactly what she's singing every time yeah. because then I might, I might add that rhythm on a snare drum, you know, yeah, right. I'll come in. It's like, okay, I'm going to add a hit here. And when you're in a Broadway situation where it's, you're in a box, yes. you know, and the sound is not necessarily good every time. Right. It's like, you got to add some other elements in there to provide cohesion to your sound. Yes. And if you're just a three piece, you got to do all sorts of things to make it sound full. And you can only do that if you're really aware, not just of listening to the vocalist and the guitarist, but really knowing how their instruments function. Right. You know, how does the guitar function? What guitar is he using? What's his tone production method? What's his, you know, is he using a compression tube pedal? You know, is right. he, you know, is the singer, you know, how is she feeling today? And does she, what key does she want this in? You know, what key is she singing right. it versus the record? You know, what other extra melismas is she adding in? Like that I can then put something on top of that, you know? And so it's like, get yourself bandmates who communicate with each other. Yeah. Just do it. You <laughs> oh know? man. Like, get yourself bandmates that will Woo! communicate, you know, and That's talk a word. Outside, outside of the band outside of the gigs i mean get yourself bandmates who want to hang out and like really dial in and get to know each other on a deep level Mm -hmm. because i mean dude it's it you so many things get solved if you do you know it's true like you if i you know the singer so well you know the guitar player's personality you know exactly what he's going to do on that stage yes and And man that's so applicable too to bring it back to your roots as the orchestral percussionist Mm -hmm. and you probably felt that more heavily with the chamber yeah. group right i mean you guys are essentially a band absolutely but then even yeah. you know with a professional orchestra it's like when you're playing especially when you're playing like a triangle part let's say mm-hmm. you're you're resting for 80 bars i mean you got to know what what the hell is going on in that orchestra you, you know don't if, if there's a vocalist yeah. you know you got to know this the yeah her part is her part you look at the yeah. the trumpet section like it's all cues from the orchestra right you know? it's it's way easier to play in an orchestra 
and deal with all that like resting and all that stuff if you just know how the piece goes. Yeah. Right. So you don't have to count. Yeah, I remember. Uh, I remember being on the stage playing <laughs> Shahrazad yeah. with uh, with uh, John the one day, and um, you know I I turned a page earlier, and someone like, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to turn a page. And he's like, dude, I know what's coming, and I'm like, <laughs> that's you do know what's coming. Yeah. You've played this thousands of times. Right. He has that whole th- he had every section of the orchestra memorized. You yeah. know, and it's like it that it all it gets. It's so much more fun. Yeah. I know some people think of it, they dread the work or they, you know, they, all that stuff. And it, it's work some days, but yeah. at the end of the day, man, it's like, it's so much more fun when you know what's going on in the band. Oh, you just, for sure. You know all the little things. Yeah. You know, you know something that someone else doesn't, mm-hmm. you know, <laughs> there's something to be said about that. Yeah. We had, um, I remember when I was in school at Central, uh, there was a 40th anniversary of this event that our school music put on called Jazz Weekend. And it was the jazz department's chance to have like the whole school music to themselves essentially and they would send like bring in like 30 or 40 different high schools would send their kids jazz bands and jazz combos and they do like a solo and ensemble band festival type thing where they get ratings they get prizes you know placed mm. and stuff like that and um, they'd have a guest artist every year who would put on a concert at the end of the festival yeah a featured concert like two hour length jazz uh, large jazz band concert with our jazz ensemble and our, our jazz teacher had that band cooking, man. I mean, it was like, it was like one o'clock band style, North Texas style music. But Jeff Hamilton was the guest. Oh! The 40, and dude, mm-hmm. he brought his entire trio. Yep. It was him and Tamir and Christoph. The Christoph was a bass player at the time. There are two things I remember from that weekend. And one was that uh, a similar thing when he was playing the charts and you could see him singing all the hits. You see, he was singing everything. And he knew every single chart, like the back of his hand, yeah. not just drum wise, but he knew the, and again, a lot of the arrangements were him and Mark Clayton's, you know, so there were his arrangements that he was singing, but you know, the eternal triangle, John Coltrane, or uh, yeah, Coltrane, I think, you know, and it's like, you have to know how to sing that to be able right. to play along that you can't yeah. not, you right. know, there's not really right. another option. Yeah. Um, and then the, the second part of it was the, uh, we had the, the day where the kids were coming in and a lot of them stayed at hotels because they'd be coming up from like Detroit to Mount Pleasant, Michigan. It's like a two and a half hour drive. Then the next day they do the whole event, concert in the night. And that Thursday night, the night before the event was supposed to happen, I think like a foot of snow dropped on Mount Pleasant <laughs> and the university closed. Oh man. It was the 40th anniversary year of this event. Yeah. And the school closed. And a bunch of the, like the, the Find Me Alpha people from the fraternity were running, helping to like sponsor it and, and uh, host it, got together and said, what can we do? And so a lot of the kids weren't able to come, unfortunately, because they didn't come that day. A lot of them couldn't make it. But the ones that were there were like stranded in this town. They a foot of snow dumped on them. Yeah. You know, they can't get their buses out. Right. Um, and they're stuck at this hotel. And so they end up renting out the conference rooms at the hotel. They went to the hotel, say, can we like get a deal? Or, and they're just like, no, just have them, you know, like just take them. Mm-hmm. Um, no one else is using them today. And they filled out the, con- the conference rooms. The, the professors from the university who are going to be judging these things came over and judged you know, and gave some like, you know, not awards, but gave ratings and comments and stuff. So the kids got to play their sets still. Yeah, that's cool. And then the best part was they went to Jeff and they said, dude, university's closed. We don't have a space. They said, are you okay if we like look for another space? I mean, it's not part of your contract. You know, it's just, I'm sorry. You know, it's going to be what we can make. And he's like, do whatever you got to do. We'll be there. He was like, wherever you need to, wherever you need me, just let me know. Essentially. And so few words. And they ended up going to the local, it's called the Ward Theater. And it was this old converted movie theater that was used as like a church. So they'd set up, you know, chairs on the concrete. But then they used it for these jazz events. And they set up just like last minute, got all this equipment over from the school, got all the Jeff stuff over there and his, his, uh, got a piano set up. You know, the piano was set up in tune and all that sound system, someone to run the sound system. And they set up all the chairs that weren't set up before. And it was like... It would have been in the, it would, the concert would have been in the large auditorium on campus. Yep. So big auditorium, big stage, you know, mm-hmm. big, all that. Thousands of people. And it was now in this tiny little theater <laughs> and it was snowing outside. It was cold and we were shoulder to shoulder packed in this little tiny theater, just on top of the stage. And the second half of the concert was just Jeff and his trio. And it was magical. <laughs> and it was the testament to you make the god dang concert happened yeah, yeah you, know? you mean, do you just what a cool do. story and it was way cooler concert than it would have been if and the whole trio been, showed up right the whole trio yeah. yeah a way cooler concert than it would have been if it would have been at the big auditorium oh, yeah. it, me- yeah. it 
means more so when it's more. like that. Yeah. yeah. I was brought to tears numerous times during really? that trio performance. He was playing, I, I don't know, there's this old AM radio song called On and On by Stephen Bishop. Have you ever heard this song? It's beautiful, mm -hmm. this beautiful just kind of rumination on like, you know, just loneliness essentially. But yeah. it's an AM radio with like congas and wind chimes and, you know, very Christopher Cross. Yeah. And, um, but he played so smooth, dude, so smooth, you know, and, but one of the most beautiful songs in the world. And they played a trio arrangement of this with wow. his band and it came on. And that was a song that like my parents had on one of their mixtapes when we go on road trips. And I was just in the mess in the crowd, you know, oh just my God. like, you know, and so it's like, again, you just don't know what's going to happen until you, you got to make the concert happen. You can't yeah. just say too bad. You know, it's just circumstances, yeah, sorry, guys. Yeah. circumstances, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, I think COVID taught that a lot of us. It's like, you can yeah. say circumstances. Being malleable, right? being flexible and just trying yeah. to do the right thing. You can say mm, yeah. circumstances say, but boy, it's always better when you say, no, I think there's a way we can. I love that. You yeah. know, so it's like, yeah, it just reminded me of that with the. Yeah. The, what a that. cool story. Yeah. So talk to us about Too Hot for Leather, right? Yeah. Is that your band or did you join yeah. as the drummer when you moved here? Um, so yeah, it, it formed it formed in pieces. I mean, Ryan's lived here for six years, if I, if I remember correctly. He'll correct me if I'm wrong, definitely. <laughs> it's six, six, and six years in a, a few months. And um, I moved in 2021. So he'd been here a long time. And uh, he was playing with another band and doing mostly like original stuff. And he was working, you know, day jobs and, and service industry stuff. And he is similar, just, I think he had a similar kind of track where it's like, you know, coming out of the pandemic and he's like, no, you know what? I'm, I'm going to make music my full-time thing. I don't want to work service industry more. I want to be a full-time musician and I just got to do it. And, yeah. um, so it was right around the time that I moved that he started doing this and started picking up gigs at Lucky Bastard Saloon. The story there is he got a music video filmed pretty recently before that, uh, one of his original tunes that he's going to be releasing soon with his EP. Plug it, plugging his EP in. He'll be super. I don't know why I get closer to the mic when I say things like this. That's good. But <laughs> no, it's fun. It's secretive. Yeah. Um, Let's talk. <laughs> just you and me. Welcome to All Things Considered. This is. <laughs> <laughs> um, but he, uh, but yeah, so he had just got a music video filmed by one of my old high school friends, Adam Eubank. And Adam Eubank was one of the guys that convinced me to move to Nashville. And he like let me stay at his house when I came out to visit. I came out during uh, like November 2020 during the pandemic. Like I flew out here and like visited and just like just to be out here. Like I didn't do a yeah. bunch of things. I didn't go out to a bunch of places. There weren't a bunch of things to do. But I just wanted to be out here. I had some friends making music. I made some music with those friends while I was here. And it was just kind of like I remember sitting that November just in their living room sitting there. And I looked at him and his wife and I'm like... Yeah, that's it. I'm moving to Nashville. Like, yeah. And they were just like, are you serious? You're doing it? He's like, we got to start looking for housing. You know, it's like <laughs> immediately, you know, like I'm going to help you looking for an apartment. So that's that guy. He's the one who filmed Ryan's video. And so Adam, from the minute I got there, he's like, hey, I it was I was trying to, as I've learned, you know, and I'm sure we can we can commiserate about this, but I was trying to join the Nashville Gig Finder Facebook page. Ha! <laughs> as one does. And uh, it took me until, I think, September yeah. of 2021 to join the page. Oh my God, dude. <laughs> until I found out about the Not So Lame page. And of course, you know, I, that's where yeah. I've done all my work since, you know, shout out to Will Gustafson and uh, et cetera, et cetera. But um, so yes. for some reason, by the way, my wife blocked, blocked from Nashville Gig Finder. It seems heck? like a lot of people are. It's like weird. for reasons unknown. Yep. Unbeknownst to Ta mankind. I yeah. talked to, what, what I can't remember the guy's name who made get, Gig Finder, but I was like, hey, uh, my wife is blocked. What's and, the scoot button? Yeah. <laughs> and, and she was never a member. He was like, no, yeah. I, I don't know why she's blocked. Like, can you unblock her? No, I can't. I was like, <laughs> sure. Okay. Goodbye now. Yeah. <laughs> right, see ya. Yeah. There's a reason why there's a literally a page called Not So Lame Gig yeah. Finder. I don't yeah. think I'm part of that. Yeah, it's, it's like a it, secret. Thing I can tell you just, this: it is not so lame. Yeah, yeah. it's yeah. If you want gigs, <laughs> yeah, go to that's, not so. No, I mean that's cool. where it all happens. Yeah, yeah. I mean I've it, heard of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. obviously yeah, stuff happens in every page, but yeah, most yeah. of it happens there now. So I couldn't get in there, and I was telling Adam, he's like, I don't know what's going on. I, was, I didn't know what was going on at the time. I didn't invite you I, to it right now. Yeah, I still, I, I'm, I'm a member of it now. Oh Sorry. him, oh yeah, him, yeah, yeah. 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 But um, I'll make it lame. Yeah. The, <laughs> <laughs> oh dang, Dan's here now. Oh come on. This is all Another going so drummer. well. Yeah. But uh, yes, yeah, so I wasn't a part of the group and I couldn't get in. And I was just like, dude, I don't know what the heck's going on. I'm just trying to get gigs. And yeah. um, and I'd already picked up one gig from, uh, I think it was National Musician. Fighter so just to back whatever, it up you know, a second. Like, so when you, when sorry, you first yeah. moved to Nash, you were, went right to Broadway and you were just doing that full time? Or? I didn't know anybody. You didn't really have any really. gigs yet, right? I didn't have any gigs. Yeah. It was just kind of, I'd, when I moved to Denver, I did a similar thing. I didn't yeah. have any work. I had mm -hmm. the school thing kind of lined up to do some educating my own. But I didn't have any work lined up. I just found work when I got there. Yep. So I was like, done it once before. 
use the same principles, you know, just see how it goes. Yep. And, um, you know, I had just enough money to kind of get by for a couple months. But yeah, and so I was, I was on there, I just couldn't find it. I'd found a gig, you said, through National Musicians Finder. It was a gig at Kimbrough's with uh, a friend of mine, Kellyanne. Same thing, connections last a long time. Mm -hmm. And um, I made a lot of friends from that group. And uh, so I'd already got a gig like that. But one day, Adam shoots me, he's shooting me text messages of screenshots from the get literally anything he thought was applicable to me. He took a screenshot of it and sent it to me. And it was like, what do you think about that? And I'd message the people and I'd not either not hear back or I wouldn't hear, you know, I'd be like, oh, sorry, we already got somebody, that kind of thing. And then one day he sends me this, this listing for need a drummer for a 10 to close on Friday night at Lucky Bastard Saloon. Had no idea what Lucky Bastard Saloon was at the time. I had not really explored Broadway yet. Hadn't had the time. I was just kind of piece by piecing, exploring Broadway. Right. You know, and, and uh, it was, I need someone for Broadway, I need a drummer and here's the set list. And it was like kind of mostly like a rock pop set list. And I was like, sweet, because I did not yeah. live here knowing country. Like I'm sure a lot of people that, you know, right. I think it's like that is the case a lot of people. And I didn't know a lot, most of the country tunes. And so I was like, whoa, this is cool. This is a rock gig. Like I know these songs, you know, yeah. like Mr. Brightside and, you know, yeah. Misery Business. And like, oh, I can totally do that, you know. But probably similar songs to that early band that you found with Craigslist, right? Um, like there's a, like there were more modern options, okay. like more of the alternative rock stuff. But in yeah. terms of the classic rock stuff, yeah, all the classic rock mm -hmm. stuff, it was like just, sure. Yeah. Let me know what you want to play. And Plus, you had done the orchestral know. auditions. You're like, yeah, I'm fine. Just yeah, and it was, <laughs> yeah, it was. Yeah, I can handle this. It was a similar thing where it was like, you know, it was that Monday. I remember it was a Monday and I saw the listing and I, I texted Adam back. I'm like, great, I'll message him on Facebook. And Adam says, no, no, no. Here's his phone number. Tell him Adam sent you. And I said, okay. And so I texted Ryan and uh, I said, hey, uh, my friend Adam, really good friend of mine, just put me on to, you know, turn me on to your post. I, I really think I could be a good fit. I love your set list. I know pretty much all these tunes and the ones I don't know, I have time to, I have time to learn this week mm -hmm. and I'll learn them for you. And he, and he's like, I'll send you a little couple videos. I had some Instagram videos I'd made of myself playing and singing and stuff just to show the, the singing side too. And, um, he was like, uh, yeah, you sound great. And he's like, so, you know, you're pretty comfortable with these tunes. I'm like, yeah, totally. And the ones I don't know, like I said, I don't know. I'll learn them this week. He's like, all right, see you Friday. Yeah. And I was like, excuse me yeah like just at the gig he's like yeah see you at the gig and yeah i, I love like, that yeah. yeah all right and that was my first experience with you know see you at the gig and, and that's uh, like here in Nashville. Quick, that's the power of a referral you know yeah, yeah. Really i've gotten was, so many yeah. gigs like that just, yeah again the power of relationships the value yeah. of relationships yeah you know, you're, not, really you're not flying is. solo but like what would have happened if it was just you mm -hmm. you know dming all these people versus like yeah. hey I can vouch for this guy, you know, he's a good, yeah. good buddy. He can play. The times when it's the hardest and when I don't have the time to socialize and do that, mm -hmm. those are the hardest times, yes. you know, that make you feel the, le the least productive. It's not even when you're playing the most, it's the time where you're like, I feel like I'm not connecting with people, yeah. you know, that's the hardest thing. But uh, yeah, and I played the gig. It was five, my first time playing on Broadway was a Friday 10 to close. Wow. <laughs> Summer of 2021. And so it you're was like, like whoa. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it was so much fun. Like, I mean, it was like you got the adrenaline hit 20 minutes in. I'm like, this is awesome. Like, damn, this is how much I can make. And then <laughs> yeah. It's like, yeah, that was another uh, thing not, too. And not I made, every night or yeah, not every day. We made you know? a significant amount of money that yeah, night. And I was yeah. like, you're kidding me. I was expecting <laughs> yeah. to make 50, 100 bucks. And yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we're coming away with that was base. You know, 350. And it yeah. was like, were you serious? Yeah. <laughs> like, interesting. And so that's when I was like, I'm going to be, I'm going to just play this place hard. You know, I'm yeah. going to go come down here as much as I can. You know, whatever gig we get offered, I'm there, you know? Mm -hmm. And I also took the gig teaching at Brentwood High School. And between those two things, I mean, it was in a month, it was like, you know, had steady enough work to pay the bills. But it was also like, I'm, you know, a lot of people, because you guys have lived here, I imagine, through 2020. You, you both were here between 2020. Yeah, that's when I moved here in 2020. Yeah, and so, of course, you me coming in after everything's done, you guys dealt with really all the issues, and then I come in after all the issues are dealt with, you know, <laughs> just to, you know, clean it up, you yeah. know. You, You're you, you guys did all the hard work, you yeah. know. And it's like, you know, and then we come in here, you know, reaping the benefits of you guys having kept the place alive. But it was, uh, it's crazy, because, yeah, when it came in, it definitely seemed like, you know, there was that period of time when a lot of people had moved away, there were gaps to be filled, you know, right, bands yeah. had stopped playing or they weren't ready to play or they had to get out of their situation so they could play because they'd taken on another situation during COVID, right. you know. And yeah, it was, it was, it was wild because I mean, uh, everyone had told me back before I moved of how just crazy it is to get a gig. It's just, you can't walk in and, you know, and we didn't walk in and get a gig, right. you know, and we were definitely not perfect. You know, we had to work really hard to get to where we are now, you know, and we spent eight months playing Monday night, 10 to close, Wednesday morning, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m., Friday and Saturday, six to 10 on the second floor, you know, yeah. to, you know, now we're playing Wednesday through Saturday, you know, six, 10, 10 to close on the main yeah. floor, you know, mm -hmm. and it's like, but that took us a year to get there. Yeah. Yeah, you have to, sure, you yeah. definitely have to eat some shit. 
Definitely, to everybody start, has to. Earn your but, stripes, yeah. yeah. But if you prove your worth, you'll get put in at least a decent slot, mm-hmm. and you can make some very, very solid money. It, it gives you opportunities. That's a big thing, too, is like, you know, at, at, I feel like, um, you know, expectations plays a big part, you know, and like realistic expectations play such a big part in like my life. To, mm-hmm. um, I'm sure it plays other ones. You know, when you have realistic expectations about a situation, 99% that situation works out just fine. Yeah. It's when you have unrealistic expectations. Yes. Yeah. You know, so for me, it was like I had the real expectation of I'm going to come here and it is going to be saturated. Yeah. It's going to be impossible to get a gig for three months. I need to have enough money to survive for three months without working. Yeah. You know, yeah. Or I have to take another job to be able to do this. And, you know, once you set those real expectations, um, sometimes, that's not how it is in a good way. It's like, oh no, I found a group that needed work and they're working pretty somewhat consistently. Yeah. So Ryan and I met up that way and we had a, we had a singer named Ali at the time, Ali Keck, uh, who uh, we've played solo shows with as well. And mm. um, bass player, Eric Torres. But, uh, but then Shannon, our singer, similar thing. Like she moved to town, I think uh, three weeks after I did, like right about the same time she had, she had gone to Berkeley for college and then lived in South Carolina for a year with her mom. And then her and her boyfriend moved at kind of the same time to Nashville. And she was doing a similar thing. She was looking for gigs. And two of her friends from Boston offered her a sub slot to co front with somebody at Lucky Bastard. I happened to get referred by one of those people to the gig as well. And so I'm playing this gig and there's this female co front. And like we both find out we're new to town. And I was just like, man, our band kind of needs like a somewhat regular singer. And I feel like, you know, a lot of our tunes and a lot of people don't necessarily know all those tunes, like, and are willing to sing them or, you know, the rock stuff, you know, I mean, it's hard, you know, yeah. it's really hard on a female vocalist to sing all that rock stuff. You know, from that gig, I realized Shannon goes hard in the paint, man. Like, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it is like super hard in the paint. And it's like, man, that'd be so cool to be able to just like, boom, here's our vocalist, you know? Yeah. And, uh, you know, and she was like, I don't know. Like, I mean, I, I, I don't know if I necessarily know all your songs. Like, I would hate to ruin the gig. And that was the vibe. I would hate to ruin your gig. And I was just like, you're too nice, man. <laughs> you know, I was sitting there and just like, just <laughs> say yes, man. Just come play the gig. You're going to be fine. You know, and they're just saying, I'm like, I'm sure you'll be just fine. And so finally, you know, and she's like, hey, okay, I'll come play a gig. And then we subbed in some others together. And she's like, I'm quitting my day job. I'm doing this full time. I want to just do this, whatever it takes. And so we all kind of did the same thing at the same time, you know. And the, one of the first gigs that Ryan, Shannon, and I played together was on that Lucky Bastard stage. And we point to the moment that you, you know, there's always a moment, you know. And the moment we knew was uh, he's walking back to get to the window. You're walking from the right side of Lucky Bastard stage to the window. You have to walk behind the singer. And she's singing, I love rock and roll. And she swung her arm at the wrong time, caught him straight in the nuts. And he is on the ground in pain, doubled over with his guitar, didn't miss a note. Wow. Play, and he's, you see just, you know, face contorted and, and you just, ah, da, ba, da, ba, man, didn't stop. <laughs> and she's like, just like, are you okay? And she's, he's like, just sing, just yeah. sing. And, um, just sing and don't look at me. You just, you, know, you just know sometimes. It's like, okay, this is going to work that's out. That's how you fine. build band chemistry. That's, <laughs> yeah. it's recommended, right? Sometimes it's just, uh, the nuts. just a right cross <laughs> square to the sensitive spots, you Jeez. know? And oh like, my uh, Lord. But, uh, but yeah, and it's like, uh, so it was in pieces, you know, I wasn't necessarily like the band was formed. Um, yeah. And you we guys didn't... from there just gelled and continued. Like, yeah. Did you guys all have the same kind of path and like, you want to sit mm-hmm. together and you all have the same vision to, to be a full-time yeah. band and, yep. you know. We all had that kind of just like, we have worked service jobs. We've worked, you know, day jobs of some sort to pay the bills. We always oh, worked multiple jobs to pay the bills in my case where I was just doing, a, I was doing music, but it was like 50 different things. Yeah. And I felt like I couldn't really get that good at any of them. Because mm-hmm. I was doing so many, you know, and it was that kind of, you know, ma- you know, jack of all trades, master of yeah. none. And it was just like, man, I need to be able to do something that I'm like the captain with, you know, or yeah. like one of the captains. This is my of, thing. You know, and, yeah. and in with Nashville, obviously, you know, there's a lot of singer songwriters and you're a member of their band, right? You're a member of the backing band. You're part of the, the team and the company, but it's a singer and you're part of the band. And we decided, you know, it was going to be like, okay, it's Shannon's band. I and mean, we decided, you know, well, let's just be, let's be all equal in this. You know, we all make the same money and we formed an LLC recently. We're officially a business, nice, uh, which is cool. It feels like we got a credit card and a bit, you know, all this stuff <laughs> we can pay for stuff for people. And it feels really yeah. good to be able to do that for other people too, you know, yeah. um, when we get basis to come in and play. But we decided we want to be equal members of this, you know, and we all kind of like, there's not, there's not enough bands out there. You know, there's a lot of singers, right? There's a lot of singer songwriters or, you know, artists, right? There's not, not enough bands, yeah, I remember mm-hmm. growing up when I was a kid, I'd listen to bands, mm. you know, like Dream Theater and Rush yeah. and, you know, Pink Floyd. And like, these guys are 
bands. Exactly. Like, these yeah. guys are all co-writing and they're, you know, they're partners. So they're all financially yeah. invested. They're all committed, you know, and, and not that there's anything wrong with singer songwriters. Don't get me wrong. There's, yeah. I, there's so many singer songwriters here that I love. You know, we just wanted to do something different. You know, we wanted yeah. to kind of go that route and fill that gap, which, and inspire kids to form bands. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's I like, love that man, mindset. That's, it's, that's it's, what made me want to play music. You it's know? actually, well, yeah. th there's a, there's a huge value in, and I talked about this in, in, uh, with Fly Information Boys. I'm like, there's, there's actually a giant, giant value in having disagreements in how the song should go. Very much so. When yeah. you're like, well, yeah, I really want to add something like this in here. I'm like, yeah, uh, he doesn't like that. But I'm like, but you love it. You're obsessed with it. And this guy thinks it's cool. Not necessarily obsessed, but thinks it's cool. Yeah. You don't I'm like, we got one, we got a positive, we got a mega positive, and we got one minor negative. We're going with it. I'm like, because this is, it's a democracy <laughs> yeah. here. Yeah. We're, right. we're like, does this ruin any, anything? Does it, does it destroy the song? No. Cool. There's mega love from this guy and you're okay with it. I'm neutral. He kind of doesn't mm -hmm. like it, but tr there's trust. Okay, no. we're doing it. Yeah, and a demo you know, to me, like the democracy situation is always just the best. Yes. To me, it really is. You know, at the end of the day, I think that's always the best. Mm -hmm. It's the hardest in a lot of ways. It you is. Know? It is incredibly difficult to run a successful democracy in any way, but it's it's so good when it works. When it doesn't work is when somebody is consistently the one who's like, well, I don't, I really don't like that and it doesn't go that way. And they're like, well, I'm going to part ways. So like, but that's natural. Yep. Yeah. And, if is, that, yeah. and that's, and that's okay. You're like, okay, yeah. well, Hey, if you're, you're not liking the stuff that we're liking, we probably shouldn't yep. work together then. Yep. That, and that, that's totally fine. Yep. That yeah. shouldn't hurt anyone's feelings. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. yeah. And I've like, you know, and I grew up, uh, I grew up an only child, you know, growing up and, yeah. uh, you know, I've got a, uh, didn't have any brothers and sisters. And so it's, it's really interesting being in a situation now where these two are like a brother and a sister to me. Right. And, and in, and in terms of like the democracy of it, it's like that it, it's weird at times that I've never had a brother and sister. I don't know what it's like to deal with having a sibling. You know, they do, they have siblings, mm -hmm. you know, and, and they've dealt with having siblings and the good and the bad, you know, and I never have, I never had to, and, you know, and, and for good and bad, you know, I mean, yeah. for a lot of ways, my childhood was great. You know, like kid for some ways it's like, yeah, it would've been fun to have a brother or sister yeah. here and there, but, yeah. but it's like never had to have a brother and sister. Yeah. And so Same. it is like, you only child. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Pound it, dude. Yeah, <laughs> Not um, me. I'm a twin and I have a yeah, sister. Yeah. Well, so. you can tell from like the every, the everything about us. Yeah. Right? <laughs> but um, selfish. But yeah. it's like, it's, <laughs> but it's really cool because like <laughs> you uh, can deny it. <laughs> no, never. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it's uh, but yeah, it's fun because you know it's it's a new challenge of you know this is this is a good thing for me. We're in a business relationship with each other, yes. But it's like, man, we were friends first. Yeah. And I and I've seen friends of mine in musical situations be in bands with people who are friends first and it falls apart. And it's like, man, I do not want to go down that road. No. And it's like, if, if it means the band breaks up, so be it, you know, you're my friends, but it's, yeah, I'm not saying that's happening obviously, but it's like, I, they got to preserve something, you know? And yeah. it's like, we reiterated family first to each other all the time where it's like, yeah, it's a family thing. Go do it. We'll figure something out. But it's like, yeah, the same thing. I mean, they're family. So it is family first, you yeah. know? Mm -hmm. And it's weird being in a place now where like, that job, this too hot for leather gig, pays the bills on its own yeah. you know, for all of us. And um, it's weird because, you know, we come to Nashville, they say, take all the gigs you can get. And it's like, I don't have necessarily time because we have to spend so much time writing. We're writing a mutual music now and we're right. with, working with a producer and we're mm -hmm. trying to brand ourselves and, you know, move off of Broadway eventually and be an original act. Yeah. And it's like, God, that takes a lot of time Oh yeah, and money and and focus. And it's like... I'm going against everything everyone told me to do, yeah. which is to work with every artist you can work with and, yeah. and you know, take all those gigs. And it's like, I don't know if I can just because this gig is just that good. Yeah. And it's that fulfilling. You yeah. Know? And and I think like, that advice, and we this comes up a lot. It's like, yeah. take all the gigs until you find that right yeah. gig. Right. It right. sounds like you found, you've kind of gotten mm -hmm. lucky. You found that gig pretty early on. Very early. Way, you too, know? way more early than I deserve to. It, yeah. You know? Just kind of nurturing like, that and just going yeah. all in on that. So, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's, too hot for leather in a nutshell. Yeah, very cool. Well, all the stuff man. I've seen looks freaking killer. Like all the branding, awesome. the marketing, the videos, pictures. Oh, thank you. Yeah, appreciate it, man. So, thank you. Yeah, yeah man. No, we're uh, we're doing our best. It's exciting times. Got a photo shoot next week. Hell yeah. What where does that name come from? Is that like a <laughs> it started as a Van joke. Halen? It thing, started or? as a joke. No, it's not. I love that you. <laughs> I love that you tried to attribute some form of legitimacy to it. Oh, yeah. it there is none. It's uh, it's it was a joke. Uh, one of our bass players who plays with us, uh, John Frisch, is his name. I don't know if you guys have run into him or not. The name um, sounds, sounds so familiar. Yeah, 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 he's he's legit. He's he's a workhorse man. Like, yeah. dude, it's if there's anybody you know, take every gig and do everything you can. Like, he can sing, he can play bass. He is a who's a production manager for an artist recently. Like, 
yeah, ridiculous. He's he's unbelievable. But he um he played bass with us. He's a friend of Ryan's. He was on stage with us on one of our Wednesday morning gigs. And we were standing, I think it was Whiskey Row, maybe we were playing on like a what Tuesday or Wednesday early shift. And on that side of the street, on that part, that block, as you know, the sun is shining straight into the windows. It sure is. Yeah, <laughs> it is shining straight into the windows. And of course, we're all dressed in our, you know, like fatigues uh, for, for work. And, you know, and so John had come down in his cold weather clothes because it was chilly outside. You walk in from the chilly and then you're on stage and you're baking. And we're staying, we're all, we were trying to figure out a name for the band that wasn't just like, hey, we're Shannon, Ryan, and Kevin. And um, just hadn't come up with something. And I remember him saying, it's like, oh, it's like, I got to take this off, man. It's like too hot for leather up here. And we're just like, why don't we just do that? That's you know? a great And I was just like, oh but, you know, let's not, let's not ask questions. That's it. Like, yeah. you know, and, and at the time, you know, we we're, we we're definitely like, you know, hadn't thought even of like branding and all. We we're just like, yeah. That's so funny. Let's do it. I love it. You know, and that's yeah. kind of where a lot of things start from. We're all kind of yeah. kids. We're all children. Especially band names. It's always like the stupidest story. The three of us are children. So <laughs> we always start from like, that's really funny. Let's do it. You yeah. Know? <laughs> In a lot of ways. So. That's awesome, man. Since we are coming to a close, since mm -hmm. I, have to, I have to go run and play a gig. Uh, nice. But yes, you do. I want. I have to go to Bridgestone for a hockey game. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah. Uh, I told him I'd be late. It's all good. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, no, it's all good. Yeah. What's upcoming for you? Good question. Um, so my friend Wiley Withers, who's a producer in town, um, he has his own home studio and does tracking in his room. Uh, he's working with a, we've worked with a few artists. He's kind of been kind enough to let me explore that side of things as well, producing and helping to like songwrite and arrange. He is going to be releasing an album. We spent last week, nine to five every day in his studio, writing out and tracking a few songs. He's got a full 10 track album that'll come out at some point. We're writing original music for Too Hot for Leather. Uh, we're working with a producer on our first single, so we're getting that around. Hopefully, that'll be out early winter. Hopefully, cross fingers. Cool. Yeah. Um, finally, get it out into the world, and then you know, just the, the kind of one-off shows. We're always playing Broadway, where they're Wednesday six to ten, Thursday through Saturday ten to close, and then just whatever gather gigs to pick up and stuff like that. Um, you know, and a lot of it is that we're just trying to get to the point where we can start marketing ourselves as an opener band. Yeah. You know, we want we want to do that. We're at that point where it's like we we have good connections in that realm through Ryan and elsewhere and through all three of us. And um, where it's like, we're, we're that close. We just got to get this music done. Yeah. We have to have a product. You have mm -hmm. to have a song. We have right. our band. We play all the cover tunes. We got to have our own music. And mm -hmm. we are just like chomping at the bit to get that stuff done. So we are pounding away. We got like six or seven songs total in demoing phase. One is done and getting recorded. And we're trying to put out a full album, you know, a full record first. You yeah. know, we weren't trying to do the EP thing. We want to get a full album out first. So those are the big things. Those are the two big things. Closing question, favorite thing about Nashville, least favorite thing about Nashville? Whoa. Then, um, then you're free. Uh, how do we do the least favorite one first? Yeah, like influencer culture's kind of coming to Nashville a bit. You know, you yeah. feel that a little bit. Not, you know, mm -hmm. and, and obviously, it's, you know, social media can be good for so many things, but there's a lot of the kind of just like transparent, I guess useless, I guess is the right way not to throw out such a f inflammatory word, but it's yeah. like, just feels useless sometimes. There's just like, we really need this here, you know. That's not what the city. That's not what it felt like. The city. Like, it's not as authentic. Here. That's not what we moved here. Yeah. You know, I didn't move here for that. I know a lot of people didn't move here for that. Mm -hmm. They moved here because it's an honest city and yeah. you work in the real economy. You know, you do something, you get paid for it. But again, it's the modern world. You know, stuff happens. You yeah. know, I, the modern world is a lot of that. You move into that realm. Um, so I get it. But yeah. it's like there's a ton of that. The best, yeah, the best part I would say it's like it's like kind of a. I was trying to decide between one or two things, but I would say it's like. There's so much Mexican food down Nolansville Pike. <laughs> oh my God! This just Dude. came up last episode. There's so much Mexican yeah. food down. I've okay, not tried restaurant, all of it yet. There's a uh, well. I mean, Bob Burrito obviously is really good. That's not like a Nolansville Pike place, but I love Bob Burrito. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's like and, a dope non-Mexican Mexican. Yeah, you spot. gotta go. Yeah, yeah, you just gotta go at some point, right? Yeah. Now I would say there's a. Uh, I can't remember the name of the place. It's Desayunos, I think. Um, it's in like an old gas station. Yes. Oh, yes. Um, the one on Nolensville by <laughs> That's Plaza how you know Mariachi. it's going to be good, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. That, it's like orange decor and they do the quesadilla there. Oh, and I went a couple of times with my friends Wiley and Daniel and I remember getting that the first time and I was like, that's what it's supposed to be. Yes. You know? Dude, I was, we were just saying this on the, on the yeah. last one. I'll say it again. No. I was blown away when I moved here. Yeah. Being from California yeah. and be, like being attached to Mexico, I'm like, yeah, you Mexican have, food. Yeah is like Lit, destroys yeah. what's what's out here and i'm like everywhere i went I'm like this is just terrible and then we discovered nolensville pike <laughs> yep. i was like oh yep. they're all out here they're all they right yeah. here awesome it's literally here. on this one yeah. strip of land yeah, yeah like <laughs> for whatever reason yeah. yeah uh cool man well just quick give yeah. us uh the plugs for yourself and the band yeah of course uh 
I'm, I'm Kevin Keith. Um, and, uh, oh, God, that's and, your name. Okay. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> just, uh, okay. <laughs> we'll just copy and paste that throughout the episode. Um, but, uh, yeah, uh, bands Too Hot for Leather, our Instagram is uh, is also Too Hot for Leather. We're on TikTok, Facebook, uh, Instagram. I'm on Instagram as well. Kevin Keith Musician. I've got some of my own solo music that I'm releasing as well. And then I'm just around. Come, I don't know, come say hi. Cool. Just say hello. You know. Well, dude, we can't wait to see what comes of you know your career and, and the band and thank um, you very much yeah, can't wait to keep talking a lot of these topics were just like yeah. I felt bad we had to keep them kind of short no, but we'll be watching your career with great interest no no I think like, <laughs> I really can't wait to see you guys out and like you know yeah, man, we'll, we'll keep chatting like, I'm sure about all this yeah. so. we'll definitely be out and seeing you guys well, that's one of the honestly one of the sickest parts about doing this podcast is is I'll, I'll I'll encounter some of these people out in the wild and then we'll have a thing we'll you know do a podcast mm-hmm. but every time I do that I'm like Oh, I feel so much more connected to you. Like yeah, now that barrier like, is yeah, it's, it's, it's gone. It's, it's gone. gone. Yeah, 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 like I would see, I would see Nico around, and I'm like, I, he's an interesting guy. I want to yeah. like to connect with him. And then every ever since, I'm like, that's like my buddy. He could be an intimidating, especially Nico. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah, like, yeah. he's kind he's kind of eccentric and interesting and yeah. like a beast. It's tall. Well, like, it was yeah. cool, man. Like yeah. I mean, I saw him playing at Johnny Cash the other night right before we went on, and uh, I was playing a gig there, and I saw him. And I'm like, are you sure that's Nico? And yeah. yeah. And I was like, oh, I just heard his podcast. I'm gonna go up and tell him that his podcast was great. It gave me a reason to talk to him. Yeah. I love that. And yeah. Yeah. Bro- again, Use that, our podcast yeah, to, that broke to down break that down your, your fear of talking to new people. Exactly. You know, we all got that. You know? Reason number 37 to listen to Nashville Drummers <sighs> Podcast, Icebreaker. Icebreaker. It's great topic at parties. Like a freaking fat penguin. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Breaking the ice. Uh, oh, man, that's funny. All right. Well, dude, thanks for the time. Thank you, man. Appreciate you guys. She heard their favorite song and she couldn't stand the sound. Eyes full of tears, she turned that wheel around. Thanks for listening to this episode of the National Drummers Podcast. If you liked it, please consider leaving us a review on the Apple Podcast app. Also, check out our new website, NashvilleDrummersPodcast.com. And if you're not already following us on Instagram, you can follow us at Nashville Drummers Podcast. This episode was recorded at Diamond Sound Studios, located in Nashville, Tennessee. Sponsored by Music Lab Nashville. Production by The Wise Company. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you in the next episode.